address the Honorable Premier. Well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Good morning and welcome to all of my colleagues back for Friday debate in the provincial legislature. Uh, all those who are tuned in at home and all those who are tuned in in the public gallery today. I see uh, John Smallwood here from Community Connections in Summerside. Uh, good to see you. And uh, we have a class, a couple of classes maybe from Montague Regional High School. There's a <coughs> number of MRHS grads in here. There's a number of Vikings in here. So uh, I'm one and a couple are sitting here behind me for sure. Uh, and uh, our Minister of Environment's not here today, but he is also. So I hope you enjoy the class. Good to see Ronnie here as well. And uh, uh, I want to say, uh, Madam Speaker, off the top that uh, I'm very excited to see that the Old Village Bakery in North Rustico is reopening on the, June the 1st under the new ownership of Kim Green. Anyone who knows Kim knows that uh, everything she touches will be successful because she works hard and she's a great planner and does great work. So I want to wish her and her team success this summer. I look forward to trying it out uh, in the beautiful uh, uh, port of North Rustico, a great summer spot, a great spot all year round. Uh, I had a chance this morning to uh, chat with the uh, four members of Parliament uh, on a number of issues, and I just the only reason I wanted to bring it up because I know there's uh, there's a civics class here, but it is unique in PEI uh, in this province that the Premier would have a chance to speak to all members of Parliament about issues that are important to Prince Edward Island. And even though there are times in here and times abroad when we have disagreements, that is a wonderful service for Prince Edward Island to be able to have that connectivity. So I wanted to thank the four MPs for making time today uh, for that. I was also excited as a sports fan to see Carla Benitez uh, moving on from Holland College after starring uh, uh, with the Hurricanes for a number of years and will now move on to the UPEI women's basketball team. Uh, a tremendous uh, player from Ecuador who's been in Prince Edward Island for the last number of years and uh, will be a great addition to Coach Matt Gamblin's team and Coach Gamblin as we've talked about in here many times and the honorable member from Charlottetown West Royalty will attest is really building a juggernaut uh, in the Atlantic Canada here at UPEI so I wanted to uh, offer my congratulations to Carla, but also the uh, continued success to Matt and the team. I wanted to also take time, because I didn't get a chance to do it yesterday, to congratulate the Minister of Finance delivering her very first budget address. Uh, that's, uh, as you can remember, a number of years back, Madam Speaker, when you were in the role, it's an exciting time, it's a nervous time that takes a lot of work and it's a culmination of a lot of work to come together. But I just wanted to say uh, congratulations on the job well done to the Minister of Finance. Uh, he did a great job and a great budget. And also wanted to say uh, uh, congratulations and thanks to the Colonel Gray High School uh, students who are continuing the tradition to participate in the Relay for Life today with a fundraising goal of $6,000. So. Thank you to those students and teachers and the administration for organizing this and keeping that wonderful tradition going at Colonel Gray. So thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and, and enjoy the proceedings today. Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I, too, want to welcome those who are watching uh, online or on, uh, their, at their homes or workplace or wherever they may be. Welcome. This is uh, uh, the Friday edition of the Legislative Assembly, so it can be a little bit... Uh, how would we say it, entertaining at times. Um, and I do want to welcome those in the gallery today, especially those in Montague Regional High sc uh, School. It's a beautiful part of Prince Edward Island, and, uh, and it's really nice to see students come in, in here to see the proceedings. Um, Emmy Callahan Junior High has an event uh, all next week. It's a, it's a uh, I guess to honor the second anniversary of Austin Keogh, who's a, a student who passed away there. So the family will be collecting uh, teddy bears, and they're going to be donating those to local hospitals. So I would encourage anyone in the West Prince area, or if you're up west uh, next week, to drop off a teddy bear to the office at Emmy Callahan. It would be greatly appreciated. I just want to mention to our lobster fishers who are out on the water today, um, the... Uh, we have lobster fishers that have 45 ports right across Prince Edward Island during the spring session. So uh, that's a large number of ports, a large number of lobster fishermen, but they um, really are one of the top economic drivers here on Prince Edward Island. So I wish them all great success and, and, and uh, safety. And also to our farmers, I mention it every day, who are out on the land. This time of the year, they're working it and they're planting it. But uh, for those who are on the highways and maybe behind a piece of machinery, just be considerate and, and understand that, again, farmers are a main economic driver to uh, our economy here on Prince Edward Island, and they have work to do, and just, just consider that while you're out on the highway. 
And with that, Madam Speaker, I will uh, close my remarks for today. Thank you. Honourable <coughs> Leader of the Third Party. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I too would like to welcome everybody to the gallery, particularly the students from Montague Regional High School. It's always great to see young people in here interested, engaged in the political process. Such an important part of our lives, whether we understand or recognize that or not. So it's lovely to see you here today and, of course, everybody else who joins us in the gallery too. Um, it's not a great day out there today, although in Scotland this would be considered a, a grand midsummer's day, but I, uh, I know there's better weather ahead this weekend, and for those of us who are keen gardeners, uh, getting stuff in the ground is, uh, you know, we're anxious to do that. I believe there's a potential for frost tonight, so maybe hold off for a day or two, but this weekend is meant to be beautiful, you know, over 20 degrees, I think, on Saturday and Sunday as well, and sunny, so I hope people get out. And one of the places that people who, you know, perhaps they rent an apartment or they have mobility issues and therefore can't have their own garden. Um, many people use uh, community lots for, for, for uh, sort of itching that, that scratch that they, scratching that itch that they have to garden. And the legacy garden that we have here, um, a legacy garden, you know, the farm in, uh, down, basically in downtown Charlottetown behind the farm center is a wonderful place. They have 200 lots there and many, many islanders take advantage of the opportunity in the eight and a half acres, I think it is, that they have to, uh, to do some gardening. About half of the lots are rented out to New Islanders, and it's a wonderful, m many people who come here are used to growing their own food. That's the, that's the culture that they come from, and to give people the opportunity to do that um, when they live in the city is great. And there's a number of uh, people living in the city who were at one time farmers who take advantage of the lots at the Legacy Garden to, again, continue that urge to grow something, and, and, uh, and it's a lovely thing. So thank you uh, to the folks that look after that. Leah Collette is the, the sort of manager, and Phil Ferraro oversees the farm centre there. So they, they offer a really fantastic service. Um, on Saturday in Kensington, there's the fourth forum, which is going to be put on by the Coalition for the Protection of PEI Lands. They've had, um, over the last few months, a number of very interesting and, and well-attended forums. And the one on Saturday, which is in Kensington, actually, at the Murray uh, Christian Centre, uh, between 2 and 4, the, the main speaker there is Jean-Paul Arsenault. Many of us would know Jean-Paul, of course. He's been uh, involved in a lot of wonderful work here on the island as a civil servant. He's now retired, although I, I think he's the... the um, He's the president of the Forestry Commission, not, not president, that's the wrong word, but he's heading up the Forestry Commission, still doing wonderful work for Islanders, and he'll be speaking there, as will uh, Bryson Guptill uh, on Saturday afternoon. A very interesting, all, always well-attended forums, and I invite anybody who's available Saturday afternoon, if you're not in your garden, to go out and, and see that. And just up the road from where I live in Strathgartney, the, the parks there um, got battered by Fiona, but they're, but they're still very beautiful and they're still very busy, actually. Almost every day I, I go by there and the parking lots, whether it's Strathgartney or down in, in Bonshaw, are very full. They're, they're extremely well used. And I want to give an enormous shout out to the folks who've cleared the trails in those parks and elsewhere across the province. We all know, you know, you just have to look in your own backyard or drive around the island and you see just how much work was involved in cleaning up. I mean, we've still got a ton of stuff to do, of course. But opening those trails, making them available to islanders, uh, was not an easy job. Uh, and having walked some of the trails in the Bonshaw Park and in Strathgartney, it's been done beautifully and very quickly, considering the, the, the amount of damage that was done. So thank you to the folks that repaired those trails and made them open to islanders. And I hope everybody has an opportunity this beautiful weekend uh, to get out and enjoy our island. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, everyone in, if you happen to be out in beautiful District 8 this weekend, uh, Stanhope Marshfield, uh, the Brackley Beach Community Centre is having their annual uh, pancake breakfast from uh, 7.30 to 10, so I encourage everyone to get out and uh, it's a wonderful breakfast. And uh, in the Thompson household uh, this weekend, we have a birthday coming up, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, my middle girl, Allison, is turning 15, so 15 going on 25, we say at home, but uh, she's, a, she's a wonderful girl, and uh, we deeply uh, love her and hope she has a great birthday. Thank you, Ms. Madam. Honorable Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I just wanted to rise uh, to say hello to everyone um, watching the proceedings today, either in person or online, and welcome to our um, gallery guests uh, today. I also want to give a warm welcome to everyone in District 5, Remy Stratford, and it sounds like it's going to be a beautiful weekend uh, with warm temperatures and sunshine, and I hope everyone uh, has an opportunity to get out and enjoy that. Um, with that in mind, I wanted to mention the IG Wealth Management Walk for Alzheimer's that's occurring tomorrow from 1 to 4 at Victoria Park, um, and all the money raised are in support of essential programs and services for honors living with dementia, their caregivers and families. This organization is near and dear to my heart, as my mother has dementia, and know all too well how important these supports are for families and loved ones with dementia. So I hope everyone has an opportunity to go enjoy um, and help this fundraiser. It's going to be a beautiful day. They have music and all kinds of things for families and kids to do. Um, so please take advantage. Thank you. Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and um, I'm honored to rise today to acknowledge guests in the gallery from Montague Regional High School. Welcome. Welcome members of the Accessibility Advisory Council, including John Smallwood, Chair and uh, John Smallwood, sorry, Chair and Representative from Community Connections. Welcome, John. Devin Broom, Vice Chair and Representative from Resource Abilities. Welcome. And Katrina Durrell. Durdell, sorry, council member and representative from the PEI Association of Community Living. Thank you so much for joining us today. As well, Madam Speaker, I'd like to recognize the great work of an important island organization, the International Children's Memorial Place, and its founders, Bill and Myra McLean, who I consider great friends of mine. This organization provides solace and support for families who have lost a child. The organization is truly doing important work in our community, and I am proud to support them. This Sunday, May 28th, the International Children's Memorial Place annual fundraising concert taking place at the College of Piping in Summerside, and I have the honor of being the MC for the evening. This fundraising concert is an opportunity for us to come together as a community to support this organization and their mission. I encourage all of you to attend and show your support for this very worthy cause. Thank you. Donald Member from Summerside Wilmot. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm pleased to rise today and just uh, welcome everybody here. It's not too often I get to welcome people that I know, but I see John Small, my back to him. I'd like to welcome him. John's, uh, he gets to be entertained by my little brother who works with him every day, so I imagine that's a treat. Uh, but the main reason I want to rise today is for the people that are watching at home. I have a very special person who sends me messages every other day, uh, Kathy Bolger. I know she's watching right now, and uh, she's one heck of a baker. During my campaign trail, she uh, had a carrot cake at my house waiting for me when I got home one night. And uh, just got to say that not much of it went to the rest of the family. I, I, I took care of it pretty well. So I just wanted to thank Kathy for watching today. Honorable wow. <laughs> Member from Charlottetown Victoria Park. Good morning to my colleagues and everybody tuning in, and the students and your teacher from Montague Regional High School. Civics education is something that's very near and dear to my heart, so I hope you enjoy the proceedings today. And to John Smallwood and Devin Broom, welcome, and your colleague as well. It's lovely to have you here. I've known John for a long time. We've shared a few laughs together over the years. Um, and very quickly, I forgot to mention this yesterday, a special shout out and thank you to the kindness of Braden Ramsey and Livia Harris. They're both grade nine students at Birchwood. As you know, I do breakfast program there. And yesterday morning, they were like locusts at that table. I turned my head for a second and the food was gone. And I was trying to refill the chocolate milk and the apples and I was running out of stuff. And so the two of them, out of the kindness of their heart, um, said that they would help me do various things. And so I told them I'd give them a shout out. So thank you very much for your kindness. Um, very quickly, it is Reggie Blanchard's birthday, a fine Summerside resident and a, a man with great character. Happy birthday, Reggie. Um, two more things. I would like to officially welcome a new baby into our family. Um, baby Cooper Wesley Peck was born on Wednesday, May 24th at 1.34 p.m., weighing in at 7 pounds, 13.5 ounces. 
uh, congratulations to his proud parents, Maddie Myers and Caden Peck, his glamma, Kelly Peck, who a lot of us know in here as the former director of child protection, and great grandparents, Marilyn and Graham Peck, as well as great aunt Ashley. Congratulations, I look forward to meeting him. And finally, Madam Speaker, I too have a 15th birthday party in my house on Monday. My daughter, Gracie, is turning 15, going on 25 as well, and I cannot believe that I have a daughter that old, I'm so young. Anyway, I wish her a happy birthday and I look forward to selling, celebrating with you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Happy Friday. Hey, everyone. Um, a quick hello to everyone. watching online and to everyone in District 11, Charlton Belvedere, and to those in the gallery from Montague Junior High, and for those also joining us. Um, there's lots of activities going on this weekend, and one I'd like to highlight is the Allen and Tracy Memorial 5K Walk Run for Autism, happening this Sunday at the Charlton Fire Hall. And um, it's exciting to be resuming for its 10th year after being in a three-year three hiatus due to COVID. Alan and Tracy were great advocates of autism and instrumental in helping inspire the adoption of the project Lifesaver on PEI. Their son Adam and a group of dedicated volunteers are continuing their legacy. Project Lifesaver is a transmitter device worn by people with wandering tendencies, people with autism, Down syndrome, Alzheimer's, or dementia. This device assists in emergency personnel like sorry, is assisted by emergency personnel um, from ground search and rescue to help locate these people. <laughs> 50 Islanders are currently using this service. So registration begins at 9 a.m. on Sunday with the event starting at 10 and a barbecue to follow. So just to highlight, imagine if your loved one wandered away and you weren't sure where they went, the feeling of panic. And imagine if instead of a search lasting for hours, it lasted 18 minutes. This is all thanks to the organization Project Lifesaver. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Welcome to everybody in the gallery. Great to see you here and everyone watching from District 15, Rusco Emerald. I, I wanted to stand and, uh, and also talk about the Old Village Bakery. Um, I wanted to congratulate uh, Barb Black here and her team who built the bakery to what it is today uh, over the years. Just fantastic uh, goods that they have there. And of course, can I congratulate new owner Kim Green. And I wanted to mention that my daughter Annika is, is actually going to be working there this summer. So I'm hoping she gains a lot of knowledge that may translate into baked goods in our, our home kitchen as well, <laughs> Madam Speaker. But uh, while I'm up, I also wanted to mention that the Villa Marguerite uh, Community Care Facility is, is having a barbecue to raise money for the Alzheimer's. Society of PEI on Saturday from 2 to 5. And I'm kind of getting the band back together. I'm going to play some music there as well. So we're really looking forward to that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I remember from Sir Elmira. Good morning, Madam Speaker. Uh, welcome to everyone in the gallery behind me. Uh, I'd like to say a special hello to everyone watching in beautiful District 1 this morning, Sir Elmira. I'd also like to spend, send a special shout out to Ted McPherson. Uh, he sent me a message this morning, said he was tuning in. Ted is an advanced care paramedic with Island DMS, my work partner, and I'll embarrass him a little bit by uh, also sharing he was the 1994 Mr. PEI for, I believe it was the World Physique Championships. <laughs> Uh, might lend to how old Ted is getting, but anyway, good morning, Ted. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, as the uh, Honourable Member said, it's a dull and dreary day, but uh, the weather looks like it's going to improve for the weekend. I hope everyone gets out and enjoys some sunshine this weekend. Madam Speaker, you'll hear me refer to District 1 as beautiful. I've spent my entire life in District 1, and it never ceases to amaze me when I look around our district at the beauty that can be found at every corner. When I cross the causeway and enter our little seaside town, I am always struck by the sense of pride for where I get to call home. We have one of the most dedicated town maintenance crews you'll find anywhere. On any given day, you'll see them out and about in the community fixing, repairing, and beautifying our little town. This morning was no exception. On my way to work this morning, I seen two employees, Emily Martin and Trevor Gallant, walking along Main Street, Surrey, picking up garbage and any debris left from the day before. Also, our town maintenance team, composed of Greg Jay, Danny Grant, and Jason LaRock, are never idle and can be counted on to tackle almost any issue that arises in the town. These above-mentioned individuals 
sometimes don't get the recognition that they deserve for their invaluable contributions to making Surrey one of the most beautiful towns in the province. So I think I can say on behalf of the residents of Surrey and myself, thank you for all that you do in your daily work. And very quickly, Madam Speaker, if I may, I would like to send a big congratulations to one of my constituents, Georgia Frazier of Chepstow. Last night, she took home the Senior Goalie of the Year Award at the annual Ringette Award Ceremony and AGM. Well done, Georgia. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. To rise and say hello to everybody in Charlottetown West Royalty and uh, all the uh, students here from Montague. I hope you enjoy everything and everybody else who's come in to watch. And um, I too want to just say I'll be joining the minister too on uh, on Saturday at the Alzheimer's and Dementia um, uh, fundraising event. That's a that's a great cause. So I look forward to seeing you there. And I just I want to. Um, just from from Alzheimer's to to uh, move into cancer a little bit. There's some there's some kids out there um, doing something very special today. So and I know I know they're watching and um, it's the the kids in Concora um, at the at the school. They are doing something very special today and um, it, it's incredible. They they set a goal to do the relay for life this year and to raise twelve thousand um, dollars for that. Um, just found out that they have, they're smashing that goal as we talk, and they're up to fifteen thousand two hundred and forty-seven dollars today. They're raising to to go to cancer and uh, to do the relay for life. That's leadership, and that's 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 something very special. So I want to say hello to them. They're watching, and I was supposed to be there, and I was supposed to do some fitness and activity, but I'd, I told them I'd rather be here with everybody here. So um, no, I'm, I'm uh, missing out. I, I just want to. I just want to make uh, to to say hello to uh, the people that were heavily involved in it. Uh, Sydney Mutar, Lily Johnson, Madison Trainer, Heidi Eckbert, Jack Affleck, Addison Baldwin, Malia Johnson, Cole Schofield, Moore Mulligan, Emily Hunter, Mackenzie Cutcliffe, Caitlin Martin, Bethany Rogers, Hannah Kaninga, and Owen. Owen uh, Conley, who are watching today. So thanks a lot. Keep going. Have the best day ever. You're doing something beyond your years. Thank you very much for your speech. Honorable Minister of Education, Early Years, and Minister Responsible for the Status of Women. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's certainly a pleasure to rise on this Friday morning. Welcome back to all of my colleagues, and hello to all of you joining us here in the gallery. It's always wonderful to see uh, these bright young minds joining us, taking it all in. So I hope you enjoy the proceedings today. Uh, Madam Speaker, I also wanted to congratulate the Minister of Finance. Uh, I haven't known her long, but I, uh, I'm, I'm just in awe at, uh, firstly, her incredibly warm personality, but secondly, she is smart as a whip. So she really presented an, an amazing budget yesterday. So again, congratulations uh, to you. Um, Madam Speaker, I also wanted to congratulate Islander Marie Kenny, who was elected Canada Area President for the Associated Country Women of the World. ACWW includes many of our national organizations that amplify the voices of rural women, including the Women's Institutes, the National Farmers Union, and Les Cercles de Fermières du Québec. This is the first time a nominee from Prince Edward Island has held this position. It's a, it's a tremendous honor for Marie. I've had the privilege of getting to know her over the last couple of years, and I know that she will be a terrific representative and advocate for Prince Edward Island and Canada. Her daughter, Autumn Tremere, is uh, also the communications officer within education. So to uh, Marie and her entire family, congratulations, and I look forward to continuing to work with you. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I remember from Charlottetown Winslow and the government whip. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. A uh, big hello to everyone in the gallery. Today I'm assuming it's uh, Mr. Munn, but a uh, big hello to uh, Ronnie Munn, a friend of mine, and all the students from uh, Montague Regional High, as well as to uh, Devin, John, and Katrina Dirtle. Katrina and I worked together uh, during the uh, George Train Memorial uh, Classic Hockey Tournament. Um, of course, uh, my campaign manager, Shannon Munn, and Katrina did all the work, but I managed to get my picture in The Guardian, so uh, thank you. Um, also, I do want to say a big congratulations to a constituent of mine, uh, Ian Cox. Uh, he's the general manager up at Canadian Tire Charlottetown along with owner uh, Cam Beach of the grand reopening. So uh, it's going to be a great weekend to get out, uh, stop by the Canadian Tire Charlottetown. 
course, you can always pick up a Big Brother Big Sister Dream Cottage ticket. And the second thing, uh, Madam Speaker, is last night I took in uh, the PEI Energy Blueprint. Uh, so it was great. Uh, constituent of mine as well, Andrew Halliday, was there, uh, kind of uh, directing people towards uh, the what what our goals are for the province in uh, climate action. And I ran into two former, uh, I ran into one member, a uh, former member of this house, and saw the name of another, uh, Ola Hammerland, uh, had stopped by there last night, as well as the former cabinet minister, Jamie Ballum. So uh, thank you very much for stopping by. If you haven't uh, been to it, and lastly, to touch on Surrey Elmira's point, a, a resident of District 10, Jeff Bryan, uh, was the official of the year last year at the ring at PEI uh, Awards. So congratulations and thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I should have done this yesterday, but I'll, I'll rise today to do this. Uh, obviously, we have a lot of vigorous uh, health care debate uh, in this House. I think there's one thing that um, nobody uh, doubts is the quality of health care that we do have once you access it. So I want to stand up today and just recognize Dr. Carroll, Dr. Jaden, um, nurses, Tanya, Lindsay, Morgan, um, Cassandra, um, the, of the care that I received last week at the QEH. I don't have a broken shoulder. I actually had a shoulder replacement surgery. So uh, we've always said that in this house that when we access care, it's, it's fantastic. And I can say firsthand that I had the best care uh, that I could ever have um, last week um, at the QEH. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Leisure, Culture, Leisure. something, <laughs> Sport and Culture. <laughs> I feel like I just should sit back down. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And usually not everyone does this many greetings on a regular day, so I kind of feel half guilty for standing up. Um, I'd also, as the leader of the opposition pointed out, I'd like to also wish uh, all the fishermen and and uh, women, um, best, of luck, best of luck as the season continues on. I know uh, some are, have, are doing very well, and then I know there's some that are in some areas that are also struggling with their catches as well. So um, they're definitely, definitely in our thoughts. Um, yesterday I had the chance to meet with Steve uh, Bellamy and Jody Zavir, uh, the CEO and CFO of the Confederation Center of the Arts. And they were giving me an update as a Minister of Culture on their major capital plans for the Confederation Center of the Arts, which will be um, a significant amount of money invested into that, into that uh, historic building, uh, which is an eco economic driver for tourism on PEI, but also the downtown. I think uh, Steve mentioned there's, I think now there's like six, over 60 restaurants within the downtown core, when there might have been 15 or 20 just a number of years ago, which is quite impressive. Um, and obviously the mainstay events, uh, headline events for this summer are The Play That Goes Wrong uh, and Maggie, uh, a new musical. And there will also be uh, two cabaret shows will play at the MAC this summer, uh, Songs of Johnny and June and I'm Every Woman. So I'd hi highly encourage everyone to get out and, and take those in when they can. And I'd also like to recognize the... Uh, Mr. Mon Civic's class in the gallery today. I had the chance to speak to them uh, probably about a month ago now. Um, so obviously a, a pleasure to have you all here. Um, we can't take credit for the member from Charlottetown Winslow being a graduate of Montague High. I think he, what, what when did you leave? Grade eight? Grade, yeah, he kind of, yeah, so, but he's from down that way. So I guess it kind of half counts, but anyways, welcome to the gallery um, and hopefully Hopefully you'll enjoy question period. But that's where the fun starts. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, honorable members, it is Friday, and greetings aren't usually this long, as uh, the Honorable Minister mentioned. But uh, we tend to talk about our districts and uh, important things that are happening in our district um, on Friday. So, but I, I'm standing to welcome everyone in the gallery. I want to, I don't get to stand every day. Uh, I feel like the speaker doesn't need to stand every day, but whenever the young people in the gallery, I will stand. But I want to say hello to everyone in District 4. Um, I want to also congratulate the Minister of Finance. I know that role very well, and you were exceptional yesterday in delivering the speech, and uh, I want to congratulate you on that. I also want to whack, welcome back the Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, he sent me pictures of his replacement, which really made me nervous because I'm going to have the same. <coughs> <clears throat> parts put in a different spot this summer, so <laughs> that makes me really nervous. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's probably too much sharing. But 
Uh, I do want to welcome the, the grade 10 uh, Canadian Civics class from Monica Regional High School. Um, teacher Ronnie Munn, and I'll, I'll list all of your names, and that goes into Hansard, which is the record that's there permanently. Your names will be in Hansard, and I'm sure your teacher will explain that to you in detail later on. If you haven't, you probably already know it. But uh, Izzy Alkama, Riley Creelman, Holm, Holmes, Caleb Durance, uh, Hannah Hogan, Josh Lungal, Maddie McDonald, Michaela McLean, uh, Haley McCarthy, Maisie Miller, Sydney Morrison, William Morrison, Aaron Saylor or Solar, um, Bridget Whalen, Peter Wu, Callie Garrison, who's a relative of mine, dist distantly from Point Prim, and lastly, but probably most importantly to me, Bridget McCarthy. Uh, Bridget, I will say, has been my co-chair for three election campaigns. Uh, she was in a car seat when she started, and. Uh, she probably knows as much about election campaigns as anyone in this room. Uh, I want to thank her for all her help. Uh, don't want to embarrass you, but I love you very much. And thank you all for coming in and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Get my paper out here. Statements by members, starting with the member from O'Leary and Verness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I am on the record of having concerns about the PEI government's decision to relocate Skills PEI and Career Development Services out of the town of O'Leary to a resort property in an unincorporated area. I will use my time today to educate this House on why this move makes little sense. First and foremost, this relocation comes with the loss of jobs within the town of O'Leary and 800 to 1,000 Western Islanders who access the services annually while visiting O'Leary. Their visit to Skills PEI and CDS lends to the town's economic growth. The town of O'Leary is home to many agencies and governmental offices that complement these services and requirements have many clients of Skills PEI and CDS utilize them, including Career Bridges, Service Canada, Community Inclusions and Social Services. It's also home to support workers or financial service workers that assist as they search for a job. Many clients are unemployed or underemployed. Others are on social assistance. Many clients utilize programs or training offered by Skills PEI and CDS that require funding. The agencies and governmental offices within the town are right around the corner. People can go to one area of PEI, sign up for help, and be surrounded by the offices that uh, can help them. It makes zero sense why government would disrupt this. Government has also stated that the new location within Mill River uh, skills PEI and CDS will be able to work better together because they will be located in the same space. Madam Speaker, Skills PEI and CDS are already located in the same space. They're right across the hall from one another. It has also been said that the new location will be more accessible. I wish to dispel this notion given the fact that the current location has an elevator and is designated an accessible building. The relocation also makes no financial sense. The current lease is for $28,453 annually and includes heat, water, sewage, and electricity. The new location carries an annual lease cost of $41,648 and does not include heat or electricity. This fiscal government is also on the hook for another $160,000 for fit up. So if anybody is up to math, that's $173,195 more money this fiscal year for new offices. But there is more. The new location is not ready. Skills PEI had to stay until at least July. The landlord was not prepared to rent by the month, so Skills PEI had to sign a year-long lease paying another $28,453 for a building they won't need. This brings the bill to fiscal this fiscal year for over $200,000. Madam Speaker, there is an access PEI property up the street that is home to two buildings owned by the province. One is vacant. Why has the government not used that building to renovate? They're spending over $200,000. That probably would be more than enough. I find it hard to believe that government is allowing an agency there owned to leave an incorporated municipality for an unincorporated resort property. PEI smaller municipalities are challenged with providing services to their residents from sidewalks, sewer, recreational facilities, maintaining fire departments to health. They need people and they need businesses and dollars to succeed. Madam Speaker, my final point. 
I'm calling on the PEI government to leave Skills PEI and CDS in its current location in O'Leary and save the taxpayer money and invest these money into added skill enhancement or health programs in West Prince. But an additional $32 million in extra interest payments in this year's budget shows that fiscal prudence is not something this government is concerned about, as it seems. Thank you, Ms. Madam Speaker. Remember, thank you for your statement. <laughs> thank you for your statement, Honorable Member. There, there are to be 90 seconds. I don't want to have to bring the stopwatch out for uh, statements by members, but uh, 90 seconds. <laughs> and on that, Minister, uh, Member from Rusty Emerald. <laughs> on that, I got to get all my papers together here, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Madam Speaker, there are, are many in District 18 Rustico Emerald that are very passionate about community, environment and addressing climate change. Today I rise to recognize a new community organization called the North Shore Climate Action for Resilience or NASCAR. NASCAR is a growing network of local residents uh, representing 13 communities on the North Shore who have been actively working together since December 2022. And the overall goal of NASCAR is to develop engagement and support for undertaking collective action to address the climate emergency and to build community resilience. NASCAR was successfully selected to be one of 30 communities across Canada to be part of the 2023 Community Climate Transitions Cohort of the Tamarack Institute. And uh, Jane Ferguson, Madam Speaker, is the driving force behind the creation of NASCAR. And I want to recognize her for her foresight and passion. I'm proud to be one of the founding members of NASCAR, a, a group of people with truly impressive credentials and knowledge and community. Madam Speaker, NASCAR has great potential to provide a portal to our communities to build real resilience. For example, when NASCAR met with the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action and, their, and his staff, NASCAR helped connect to the department with and engage the appropriate community members to allow PEI to become the first jurisdiction in North America to plan a vehicle to grid implementation. I want to uh, commend NASCAR on actively working towards the development of a resident-led, multi-sector climate action plan. And as the government's manager of climate, the Climate Change Secretariat, uh, Peter Nishimura, said at the recent information session in Rustico Emerald, if we deal with our most vulnerable populations, everyone will be fine. So, Madam Speaker, stay tuned. There will be much more to become on NASCAR initiatives. <laughs> Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Belvedere. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize a recent Heritage Celebration, recent Heritage Celebration <laughs> <laughs> Award winners in Charlottetown. <laughs> Keep going. The City of Charlottetown recently celebrated Heritage Day with award ceremonies which honoured individuals as well as organizations in the community who have shown passion for their preserving and celebrating the city's heritage. I would like to especially recognize a constituent, Linda Hennessy, on being a recipient of the 2023 Charlottetown Heritage Day Award for her efforts and passions. As a longtime researcher, and presenter of Black History on PEI, Linda has diligently spent over 30 years researching and sharing stories of Prince Edward Island's black families and descend with descendants. She is a descendant of the first black families in Charlottetown's 19th century Bog neighborhood. Throughout the years, Linda has shared her extensive knowledge through speaking engagements, exhibits, and podcasts with Black Culture Society, the Prince Edward Island Advisory Council on Status of Women, and the Prince Edward Island Museum and Heritage Foundation. Congratulations once again to Linda and all the Heritage Celebration Award recipients. In addition, Madam Speaker, I'd like to recognize Wayne Proud on his recent retirement from Proud Shoes. Wayne Proud started his own store called Proud Shoes in the 1960s and recently marked his 65th anniversary of selling shoes. And on a sidebar, I'm going to tell you that when I was a little girl, my mom used to take me to Proud Shoes, and that's where I got my shoes when I was young and continued on for many years, and my children got their shoes there, and um, it was certainly a fantastic shoe store. Proud Shoes has formally formed great partnerships over the years between the Queen Elizabeth, uh, Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Charlottetown Nursing Homes, and his yearly clearance sale in Vernon River. He's also supported running, supported running events for several years. Congratulations, Wayne, and best wishes to your son, Kevin, as he continues to run the family business. 
you'll be proud with your shoes from Prouds. And Madam Speaker, I'm proud to wear my shoes from Prouds. Questions by members, starting with uh, responses to questions taken as notice. <coughs> Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. With yesterday's budget presentation, I think it was made clear that this government is lacking in vision and new ideas. Right when Islanders need leadership and big thinking from government the most. Madam Speaker, the other point of clarity yesterday is that this government, despite some of its members complaining about our federal government, rely on federal transfers and federal money just to keep the lights on and programs running. Question to the Minister of Finance. How much money has Prince Edward Island received from federal transfers over the last year, and how much federal money does your budget account for this year? Honorable Minister of Finance. Um, we get uh, federal transfers, we get equalization payments, and we get, um, we got a health transfer tax this year. Um, and there'll be other things that come into play, like the child care agreement that we carry with the federal government, as well as um, infrastructure. infrastructure funding that we get. So those would be the four big ones that we get from the feds. As far as the specific numbers, I'll get back to you on that. Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Well, I can tell you, these are huge, huge sums of money. And this government is never shy about asking the federal government for more. So question to the Minister. Can you tell the House what percentage of this year's revenues will come from the federal government and what percentage is coming from provincial sources? Um, Minister of Finance. I believe the number on the, on the provincial side and what we collect in taxes is 59%. Um, again, on the federal side, I'll, that's something I'll have to get back to you on. Thanks, Madam Speaker. I'm the Leader of the Opposition. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, uh, we have different numbers. Only 54% of this government's projected revenues are coming from provincial sources. In other words, almost 50% of proposed spending for this government is coming from federal money. Question to the Minister. It is fair to say that if federal government revenue sources were reduced, your government would have to drastically curtail either program funding or seek other new revenue sources, such as fees or taxes. Is that correct? The Honourable Minister of Finance. I think a big part of this is relationships and uh, being able to work with our federal partners on bringing funding to the island. Um, and I think that our Premier and our team members do a great job of keeping up those relationships and ensuring that that money continues to flow. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Well, we know that this government signed a deal with the federal government that increased federal health care transfers to the tune of $288 million just this year. This question to the Minister. Can you tell the House what percentage of total health care spending in this budget is, funding, is funded uh, by the federal government? Honourable Minister of Finance. I think I can, I can take a bit of that. I think I would direct part of that to the Health Minister. I know that um, and probably what a lot of Islanders are thinking about is the health transfers that was talked about. Um, and we did take in $74 million um, from the feds on this provincial, on, uh, reg regarding health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. On the Leader of the Opposition. <clears throat> Madam, Madam Speaker, it was this minister's uh, budget. So those numbers are in your budget. Um, so we know that the federal government took steps to ensure that the new $288 million for health care must, and say must be spent on healthcare in this province. As other conservative provinces have a history of accepting healthcare funding and using it for other things such as tax cuts. So question to the Minister. How can Islanders know for a fact that this $288 million in federal funding will in fact all go towards healthcare funding when you can't even tell us how much proposed expenditures come from federal transfers this year? The Honourable Premier. Speaker, just to clarify, and I clarified this last uh, this week with the Honourable Leader of the Opposition, but as seems to be consistent in here, uh, he doesn't want to quote the facts. The facts are that the money coming from the Canada Health Transfer requires each province to come up with a work plan to make sure that we qualify for the money that has been allotted. We have gone through the process to develop a work plan which the federal government is supporting and every single cent 
that the federal government will bring here for health will be spent on health along with more money from the provincial government because health care is the top priority for Islanders and we're going to put every cent in that we can. So please stop with this game of trying to say we're not using the money for health when we're obligated under the law to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Speaker, let the Premier put his money where his mouth is. Um, will you commit, I'm going to ask the Minister, will you commit to bringing back a detailed breakdown of how federal transfer dollars are being spent throughout this budget, especially as it regards to health care? Honourable Minister of Finance. I can do that. Thank you. I'm the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. As I said yesterday, on top of a record deficit, we are seeing a total deficit of new ideas from this government to address the challenges that are facing Islanders. Question to the Premier. Is your only new idea to try and take credit for federal money and federal initiatives by passing them off as your own? Honourable Premier. Well, Madam Speaker, I don't know if you would find a Premier in this country who has applauded the federal government more and has worked harder to build a positive relationship that has made a positive a contribution and impact on the province of Prince Edward Island than the person standing here answering this question. I don't know why the Leader of the Opposition is trying to drive a wedge between the province and the federal government. We have a wonderful working relationship. The Federal Minister of Health came down here and participated in the announcement of the Canada Health Transfer and said, and I quote, I wish every province was taking this as seriously and doing exactly what Prince Edward Island is doing. I don't know why you're trying to drive away. Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We're not looking for... Well, what we're looking for is more for clarity, and I think you should speak some to some of your cabinet uh, and caucus members about this, because it's not the same message as that's going out there. So, Madam Speaker, this government made an ambitious promise in the past election about 30 medical homes that would erase the patient registry by the end of next year. Mm. And yesterday, government said they would hire 100 new frontline health workers to staff these homes by throwing another $8.9 million at us. Madam Speaker, we are already short-staffed when it comes to frontline health workers. Yet this government thinks they can hire 100 more staff in the next 12 months. Question to the Minister of Health. How many of your 10 current medical homes are short-staffed today, and how much of this budget allocation will be used to fulfill those vacant spots? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, and a great question uh, from the Honourable Member. I think it's important to note from yesterday that Medical homes are, are not a place, it's more of a model of care. So each mo uh, medical home will be different, especially in the way that they're panel of, of patients that they serve. For example, if, if a doctor ha uh, has a lot of diabetic um, patients on his panel, they'll have some diabetic support within that home. So I think it's important to, that not all homes will be the same, but it's a model of care. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. That, that had absolutely nothing to do with the question I had just asked. As a Madam Speaker, the recruitment for health care workers is uh, competitive right across this country. We all know that. The Premier himself has told us multiple times, and voters in the past election, we are in a mess, but trust me, it'll be fine under my tenure. Question to the Minister. Can you give us a breakdown of these 100 <laughs> staff, how many doctors, nurse practitioners, RNs, oh, LPNs, please. dietitians, physiotherapists, and other frontline staff Please will be. The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you uh, for the question. Obviously, um, as the Honourable Member would know, the Peachy Report came out last week, which uh, details some of our labour uh, requirements for the next short term and long term. It's a great planning document. It will guide us in the future, and it should have been done 13 years ago when the Liberals were in government, but we did it, and we're proud of it. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So with that report right now, there are over 700 vacancies in health PEI. 100 new positions is not going to solve this problem, Madam Speaker. Question to the Minister. What is your plan to ensure that health PEI has the full complement of staff required to run the world-class health system we used to have in this province? Well, 
Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I think we'll see that in the de budget debate where we're investing more in recruitment and retention. And we understand it's a challenging time to re recruit health care uh, workers. So we're working on scope of practice. Again, you've seen the, uh, the uh, Regulated uh, Health Professionals Act that we passed the other day, and I appreciate uh, everyone's support on that. So again, lots of steps to bring down hurdles uh, with regards to licensure, to, to increase our staff on PEI, and we'll continue to work on that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I believe in the opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. This government loves to make grand promises and tell auditors they are with you, for you. Mm. Well, we've been pointing out for weeks now that ERs are shutting down, hospital waiting rooms are overcrowded, walk-in clinics are packed on a daily basis, and we are witnessing a system mid-collapse. We don't have the staff today to run the system, and you think you will add 100 new positions? We'll put them out of these, uh, into these homes? Minister, you want to add 100 new positions and 16 homes. Can you guarantee that you won't be pulling these workers to these homes from the front line that is already understaffed today? Honorable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, obviously, um, one thing about these collaborative care centers is that new grads coming out of school want to work in these environments. So I think that gives us an advantage on the recruiting side. This is the way they're trained today. This is the environments that they want to work in. So I think we're ahead of a lot of jurisdictions in this model. So I think we should be a very attractive place for uh, health care workers in the future. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Mental health and addictions affect almost every family on, on the island. It would be hard pressed to find one person in our province who does not have a loved one or close friend who has experienced mental health illness or addiction. The official opposition had high hopes for the second term government to improve how they take care and support islanders who are struggling. Yesterday's budget shows health PEI's projected spending to be nearly $1 billion, Madam Speaker. That is an exceptional amount of taxpayers' money. Question to the Minister of Health. We've heard time and time again from this government that helping islanders with addictions is one of your main priorities, so we hoped your budget would reflect that. Minister, why does addiction services represent only 2% of the health PEI budget? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Obviously, it is a large budget. We recognize that. Um, it does t touch a lot of things. I think um, community-based mental health is a big strategy that we want to have uh, going forward to, to serve those people where they need it and when they need it. So again, we've made some steps in health in mental health. The campus is a generational project, um, and I think it will benefit Islanders in the future. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Charlottetown That's why I'm asking this. We're not delivering the services where Islanders need it and when they need it. That's the problem. Shovels in the ground day one, mental health walk-in clinics, mobile mental health response teams 24-7, all things over-promised by this government and under-delivered on. Again, with this new budget, we hope to see concrete action to address the gaps in mental health, health care services in our province. Question to the Minister of Health. How do you explain that your mental health budget is only 6% of health PEI's spending? Mm -hmm. yeah, the Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and I do look forward to the debate on the entire budget um, as we move forward, and I guess we'll get into the details of, of what those numbers mean and where the other uh, supports are within that budget. Again, it, I believe, I don't have the historical uh, data on this, but a 14% increase, I believe, is one of the largest in history, and we're very proud of, that, uh, of the budget that we're putting forward for, to serve Islanders in health. Thank you, Madam Speaker. because we're hearing it at the doors. We all heard it at the doors. Um, we need to do more, and we need to do it now. Madam Speaker, when this government first came to power in 2019, they made commitments to take mental health and addiction seriously. But we see in this budget, it was just more empty words and broken promises. Question to the Minister. Will you tell this House how much you increased the corporate service budget for health PEI, which includes salary increases for health PEI senior management? Well, Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Obviously, it is difficult in question period to, to debate a, a billion dollar budget and where that money goes. So obviously, um, there is money in there for uh, lots of services at Health PEI. One of them is recruitment and retention. I can tell you that is that we're increasing uh, our, our investment in that division. So again, we are making a significant, I think, record investments in health and we will continue to do so. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. It's important, but I, I'm not sure if you're recruiting for health PEI um, management because they saw their budget increase 23%. Mm -hmm. 
So who are we recruiting? Are we recruiting frontline or are we recruiting management? It's important. Addiction services only account for 2% of the health PEI budget and mental health only make up 6% of the health PEI budget, but yet almost 25% is going into corporate management. Question to the minister. How do you justify small no. increases for the struggling with mental health and addictions and such large increases for senior management? Honourable <laughs> Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I do appreciate the question and, and again the Honourable Member's um, work on mental health issues. He, he does a great job of advocating um, for mental health and, and we need to listen to the member as much as we can. Obviously um, we are making record investments and we're taking some new tactics again with the FACT teams and stuff like that in order to support the, the most complex mental health needs that we have in our community. So we'll continue to do that and I look forward to the debate uh, on the budget in the future. Thank you Madam Speaker. Honourable Member for Charlottetown West Royalty. Well, thank you. I appreciate the debate in here. It's, it's very important. And um, I, I'm worried at this time for mental health addictions, but also the mental health concerns facing our frontline staff, especially at the QEH. Um, we, see, we see growing concerns. I'm hearing it every day that, that they're stressed and they're, they're burning out, especially all through the system, but especially at this hospital over the last two weeks. Question to the minister. Can you explain a 23% increase for health PEI corporate services will alleviate the burnout amongst the health frontline health care workers, especially at the QEH? How does that help them? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I do appreciate the question. I think uh, one of the things I talked about yesterday was the short stay uh, mental health unit at the QEH, which is scheduled to be completed this year. I think that's going to take a lot of pressures off our ER uh, department, which again, the entire hospital is, is, is working extremely hard, but I think there's significant pressures there, as we talked about yesterday. So we're looking forward to that. I had a tour of that. A uh, short stay unit. It's on schedule uh, to open uh, in late fall uh, the, of this year, and I think that's going to be a significant release for the pressure that is currently on those staff at that hospital. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. I'm optimistic about that. Uh, I'm very optimistic about that, but I'm concerned too because if somebody presents there uh, showing uh, concerns, example for, for for chest pain, where do they go? They go to the emergency room first. I don't know if. I'm just very worried about that. Minister, can you, can you tell us that when that's going to open and that it's going to alleviate the pressures in the ER system at the QEH? Oh, Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I did ask that question when I had the tour um, um, to, to, uh, to Mr. Walker. And, and their estimates are about 30% of the current people that present at the uh, ER are experiencing mental health challenges. But they think it may be as high as 50%. So obviously, um, they have. I think this was reported in the news too as well. So that's going to be a significant impact on, on, on the flow at the QH. But I'm not, I want to discount uh, how how challenging it is, and we appreciate those workers um, at the ER and the front lines that, that serve our, the people of PEI. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I will member from O'Leary and Verness. Madam Speaker. <coughs> Hurricane Fiona hit this province last September, but cleanup continues. The Minister of Transportation re recently announced an extension of residential yard cleanup to assist those still cleaning up damage from the hurricane. He made this announcement on May 17th. Recently, at a public meeting of the West Point Development Corporation, attendees were told Trails around the West Point Lighthouse for hiking and walking have significant damage and need to be repaired. Question to the Minister responsible for transportation. Uh, will not-for-profit organizations who have endured damage from the hurricane be able to qualify for these properties to be cleaned up? Honorable Premier. Uh, well, Madam Speaker, uh, seeing as the Minister isn't here, uh, I, I will just have to take my the question under advisement, but I will say that uh, we have committed to continuing to assist islanders uh, in their homes, community, community groups, and woodlot owners to do the very best we can uh, with the Fiona cleanup, uh, which is extensive. It was the biggest natural disaster to hit the region in our history. Uh, and the cleanup, as we've talked about in here, uh, has been, it's been a huge task so far, and there's a huge task that lies ahead of it, but we're committed to working with islanders to clean it up as soon as we possibly can. Honorable member from O'Leary and Verness. It's the same at the uh, Time Valley Cavendish Farms rink. Several trees have fallen onto their property and although not a risk to public safety, it does have an impact on the aesthetics and the look of the property. With events like the Oyster Festival drawing numerous tourists to the rink, it would be nice to have these volunteer organizations get some help to make their facilities usable and aesthetically pleasing. 
The Han Valley Rink has basically a volunteer crew. It's made up of large, largely uh, individuals that are more community oriented, and they don't usually have the ability to operate chainsaws. Question to the minister responsible for transportation. Will not-for-profits who require tree cleanup on their properties be eligible to get their properties cleaned up through this program? Honorable Premier. Uh, again, uh, Madam Speaker, our commitment is that we want to work with every group uh, and, and islander that we can to assist in the cleanup. It, it is a huge task. It, it's a big undertaking. Uh, Tyne Valley Rink, uh, there, there's uh, uh, Eastern Kings Arena, there's so many challenges uh, with, uh, with our um, NGOs and our not-for-profit groups across the board. I'll commit to, uh, again, to doing everything we possibly can to work with as many islanders as we can to get this cleaned up, uh, uh, to continue it, and, and to do our best we can to get it cleaned up. But it's a, it's, it's a Herculean task, to, to say the least. Honorable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. A couple of days ago in this House, we debated a bill on fines related to buffer zones. And when crafting laws, it's very important for this legislature to avoid creating conflicts between statutes. And when it comes to buffer zones, there are two Prince Edward Island laws that define how big a buffer zone is. There's the Environmental Protection Act and there's the Planning Act. And unfortunately, they are not consistent, leading to confusion. The Department of Housing, Land and Communities issues development permits. Could the Minister clarify which act his department considers when they're trying to resolve permitting disputes over a buffer zone? The Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, we try to work collaboratively across uh, departments to, uh, to uh, um, uh, resolve disputes around buffer zones. Um, I know that uh, as we go through the process of the Provincial Land Use Act, there will be uh, a lot of discussion about uh, the processes for, for permitting and development uh, permits. Um, I can say that um, we are working to break down some barriers between departments right now to improve those processes in the interim. There is a state of the coast project that's going on right now that will be incorporated into the first deliverable of the Provincial Land Use plan and uh, that will inform decisions about how we uh, 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 control development in buffer zones. I believe it's a third party. <laughs> Thanks. I wish there was some clarity there that the department that issues development permits uses its own statute when, dis when figuring out where the buffer zone starts and finishes. The setback which defines the buffer zone, according to the Planning Act from the Minister's Department, is 75 feet or 60 times the annual rate of erosion of a particular area, whichever is greater. And that, of course, could be significantly greater than 75 feet. The setback, according to the Environmental Protection Act, is set at 50 feet. The buffer zone on all our shorelines is measured from where the ordinary high tide line and the corresponding bank are. And as we all know, our island is eroding fast. And the ordinary high tide line and the banks are not static. They are moving. They're moving inland in some places at an alarming rate to the same minister. When permitting new developments on our shorelines, are we always taking into account the moving high tide mark when we make those decisions? Oh, minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, well, I can't say exactly um, uh, uh, what takes place with each indiv individual permit. I know that um, as with any development permit, uh, the department has the ability to issue variances, and they take into consideration all, uh, uh, all of the criteria. And um, uh, it's something that certainly we'll, uh, we'll be discussing as we develop our provincial land use map to going into the future. We know that there are many more considerations. Uh, we're all become uh, quite aware of that, and uh, we'll take those into consideration as we move forward with the Planning Act uh, amendments. I believe the third party your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. In Point de Roche, the developer was allowed to build armoring, which clearly extends beyond the ordinary high tide line is dumped right on a public beach blocking access. If your department was taking into consideration the current high tide mark and the erosion rates, and you just have to look at where the banks are on either side of this development to see where the real bank edge is, this development should never have been permitted, and the beach would be still accessible to islanders. To the same minister, what are you doing? to fix the monstrosity at Point de Roche and ensure that this kind of development never, ever happens again on our island. 
Honorable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Well, I think we can all agree that um, uh, the issue at Point Durage is a turning point uh, in our understanding uh, and, and what we value about our coasts and our shorelines and how we take uh, climate change uh, uh, seriously and how we adapt to that and how we uh, adapt our provincial legislation around all these issues. I, I'm sure it will be a uh, a focal point in our discussions about the provincial land use plan when we get there. And uh, yes, uh, you know, I look forward to those discussions and uh, how we plan for our future around our coasts and our access to our beaches. And uh, it's, it's a very important issue, and I look forward to those discussions. I'm a member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Under this government, the number of accidental opioid-related overdose and deaths in PEI has increased every single year. These are not data points. These are friends and loved ones that are falling through the cracks due to a lack of health care. The provincial budget tabled yesterday makes no mention of new or expanded addiction services in PEI. To the Minister of Health and Wellness, how many more islanders will have to overdose and how many more will die before this government meaningfully improves addiction services for islanders? Thank you, Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank the member for the question. I do agree with it. Uh, we have reached a point uh, where of it's uh, so serious, even in my district alone, um, there was a, a seizure of a significant amount of fentanyl, which is very concerning uh, of it as well. So. Again, we recognize the importance, it's growing, and we need to address it, and I would absolutely agree with the Honourable Member. Thank you. Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, for supplementary. I hope you agree with me. I yeah. hope you're, you're taking actions to fix that. That's your job. Since the Premier came to power in 2019, just up until last September, 23 Islanders have lost their lives due to accidental overdoses. Wait times for detox beds can be months. Wait times for counseling or therapy services can be just as long or longer. And often there is no safe place for these islanders to go if they are in active addiction. Question to the same minister. Why have you chosen to add no increased investment into services or safety for islanders struggling with addiction? Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, we, we will continue to support, um, you know, obviously, uh, the, these clients and what they do. We do have some, some phone-based services like NORS and the Brave app, which again are not uh, ideal, but they do support uh, responsible use uh, um, and, and safety. Uh, obviously, uh, we also uh, offer fentanyl strips to, um, through our needle exchange program. So we do recognize that we need to, to uh, provide um, support to these clients and we will continue to do so. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, your second supplementary. Madam Speaker, and phone-based services, we need to talk to the clients, talk to the people who are living with addiction, to see what it is that they need, not what we think they need. The government won't tell us the location of the overdose prevention site. It wouldn't even mention it in its budget address, which is a list of the government's priorities for the fiscal year. Minister of Health, why should anyone believe an overdose prevention site is a priority for this government? Minister of Health and Wellness. Uh, it actually very much is a top priority for our department. Uh, we know the importance of it. Um, it reduces public substance abuse, uh, discarded needles. It's been proven to uh, protect people from harm. At times, I think it's Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland that do not have uh, an OPS site, so it's important for us to work on, on that file. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable member from Tyne Valley, Sherbrooke. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> We know that mental health issues like anxiety and depression affect many Canadians. A key stressor for many experiencing that is around their personal financial health. And I think it was reported last night that in Canada, we now have the highest household debt in the G7. 46% of people with debt also have mental health issues. So my question to the Minister of Education and Early Learning what do we currently do in our schools to teach basic financial literacy skills to our island students? Honourable Minister of Education, Early Years, and Minister Responsible for the Status of Women. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member, uh, for the question. Certainly a very 
fitting question uh, with the budget having just been presented. Uh, we know the importance of ensuring that our young people learn about money management at a, at a young age in order to set them up for lifelong success and financial literacy enables students to understand concepts like budgeting, savings, investing, managing debt, etc. The list goes on and on. Madam Speaker, uh, within our school system, every student participates in financial liter literacy through our math curriculum. Uh, at grade 10, students complete a financial literacy course as part of the mandatory CEO curriculum and also for the 2023-2024 for school year, a new financial literacy module is being added to the intermediate level exploratory options. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member from Time Valley Sherbrooke, your first supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Madam Speaker, from what I am told, I met with a few students and they suggest that we just touch on it. And, uh, and it is not a credit within the school system. We live in very difficult times where things like high inflation along with high interest and credit card rates add to financial pressures, an increase in solvencies and even bankruptcies. So the question to the Minister of Education, Early Learning, are we looking to increase, I guess you might have touched on it, the education given to our island students around these important issues that will impact students for all of their lives. Um, Minister of Education, early years, is responsible for the status of women. Thank you, Madam Speaker. We have a uh, strong team within our curriculum um, who is consistently working to improve um, the curriculum and its delivery and, its, and the outcomes. Uh, as I did mention, we, are, um, we will be rolling out a new financial literacy module. Uh, at the intermediate level. Um, that being said, I agree this is an incredibly important topic, uh, very relevant given the nature of the times that we're living in, and I would love to explore opportunities to further enhance our programming. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member from Time Valley, Sherbrooke, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, last year, Ontario brought in a mandatory course on financial literacy, the first province to do so. The ability of our students to understand things like budgeting, banking fees, credit cards, loans and mortgages are life skills that they need and use, will use all their lives. This could also help improve the mental health of our students now and in the future, which is something we all want. So question to the Minister, will you have your department look at what Ontario has done and see if there's opportunities to add a credit to give students more of these valuable life skills. Education early years. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker, and absolutely, I commit to um, to looking what at what Ontario is doing and. Um, other jurisdictions across Canada are doing. Uh, as I had mentioned, um, the CEO course is compulsory and a significant portion of that would be dedicated to financial literacy, but again, there's always opportunities to do more. So if, if Alberta, or Ontario is leading the way in this, certainly, you know, PEI, we can, uh, we can follow suit. And uh, Madam Speaker, I'd be remiss uh, not to talk about some of the wonderful organizations like Young Million Millionaire, Junior Achievement, who uh, we consistently partner with, and uh, they help support us in our schools. I know I was a volunteer with Junior Achievement back in the day, and I would uh, head out to intermediate schools and, and teach um, some basic concepts around budgeting and that. So I'd really love to continue to enhance and improve the relationships with organizations such as those. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member from Kensington Malpeck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> This is my first time up with questions since taking on my new role. I've been trying to lower my blood pressure, Madam Speaker. <laughs> and I'm hoping the Minister of Economic Growth can help me with that. The state of our cell phone service in the province seems to be getting worse. I've heard more complaints about dead zones than I have the whole time I've been elected. Especially when we pay some of the highest prices for cell phones in the world. Question to the Minister of Economic Growth. What is the current state of the cell phone service in the province? Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Thank you, Honourable Member, for the question, and I'll try to help lower your blood pressure. Uh, <laughs> cellular service uh, is federally uh, regulated, as probably the member would, would recognize, but I agree. Uh, we have to work to have a, a, a stable and uh, reliable cell service for our province, for our residents and for our businesses. We will continue to advocate 
for PI and raise this with our federal partners as much as we can. So thank you, Madam, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member from Kensington Malpeck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. At a time of population growth and more unpredictable weather from climate change, the need for reliable cell service is greater than ever. Question to the Minister of Economic Growth. How does the province plan to work with cell phone carriers to improve coverage and reliability in the face of population growth and climate change? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Cell phone coverage is something uh, I would like to see continually improve across PEI. Uh, we want stable and reliable services, like I said, in the province. Uh, telecommunications self-coverage is federally regulated, like I mentioned in the, my first response. Uh, my department has been in touch with the Federal Department for Rural Economic Development, Innovation and Science to share information about this. We will continue to collaborate uh, with the federal uh, or our federal partners. We will take a collaborative approach to make improvements, and we will follow up and we will continue to push for this at the federal level. Uh, Honourable Member from Kensington, Maltec, and the Government House Leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <laughs> services like cell phones and high-speed internet are essential services in this day and age. I know in my former role that we made some great strides on improving oh, access yeah. to high-speed internet. <laughs> And I'd like to see us do the same around cell service. Question of the Minister of Economic Growth. Will you have your department take a look into this issue so we can get a better understanding of the gaps that need to be filled to improve cell service for all islands? Honourable Member, Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, definitely our department is interested in pursuing uh, the work that was done by the previous minister, and we will continue to do so. Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah. Madam Speaker, just to finish off my line of question previously, uh, in both cases, the West Point Development Corporation and the Rincon Tyne Valley were told by the Department of Transportation they didn't have the time to clean this work up. Uh, so the minister responsible for uh, transportation uh, will uh, this uh, either either residential or nonprofit uh, site cleanup be provided by the Department of Transportation staff, or will a private contractor be paid to do this work on the instruction of transportation staff, or will funds be given to the nonprofits uh, to hire a contractor? Honourable Premier. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and uh, quite honestly, it could be a combination of all of those things, uh, I think it, which it might need to be. As the Minister of Environment uh, talked about earlier this week, there is a group uh, of uh, ministries that are working together to try to take the, uh, the lead on this and, and, to, uh, and to lean into it to the point where we can make a difference uh, as quickly as we can. So I think it will be a combination of that. As we look toward uh, the cleanup, I know it came up in ERCOC as yesterday that, uh, it, for example, the city of Charlottetown, the city of Summerside undertook a lot of the cleaning of their own uh, and then just recouped the cost under the, uh, the emergency uh, fund. Uh, so we'll need to work with them to figure out how we can do that because people in the city of Summerside and Charlottetown will require cleanup, continued cleanup as well. So I think the roundabout way to say I think it's all of that, but uh, as I, I think maybe we could begin to prioritize a list of what immediately needs to be done uh, and, and try to get that attended to as quickly as possible and then work on uh, uh, across the island as, as we get there. So thank you. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. So I just want to take one moment and welcome to the gallery um, Matt Kelly, a teacher from Montague and his class. So um, question to the Minister of Health. How many health PI vacancies are there in Kings County? How many health PEI vacancies are there in Queens County? And how many health PEI vacancies are in Prince County? The Honourable Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm sure that's a, a, an ever-evolving number. Um, well, it goes up and down, but I, I, I would suspect that the member probably knows the answer to the question, but I will gladly bring that back for him. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition, the final question. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, Minister, will you be able to table the number of health PI vacancies per classification and also table the number of health PI vacant positions per facility? The Honourable Mem uh, Minister of Health and Wellness. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, that is a great suggestion, and I'm not sure how they track that data, but obviously we can ask the department to see how, uh, if they can access that data in a, in a timely fashion and bring that back. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <clears throat> End of question period. Honourable members, um, I just want to rise and welcome uh, all of the students in the gallery. Um, the second group, um, 
from Monica Regional High School, and I believe it's grade 11 law class. And uh, welcome. I hope you're enjoying the proceedings. You got to hear a little bit of fiery debate, and that's always important. Um, teacher Matt Kelly, and I'll read your names into Hansard, which is where it will be for eternity. So your teacher can explain that to you afterwards. <laughs> um, Ella Drake is here, Logan Chandler, uh, Nanka Hanspel, Pal, uh, Peyton McLean, uh, Eli Reyna, Grace Robertson, uh, Dana or Dana Holland, Rebecca Scrites, Scrites, Scrites. Yeah, okay. Uh, Leah McDonald, Ali Palmer, Regan Ford, Ella McPhee, Dallas Singleton, Abby Kemp. Uh, ben Alkama, L. McKenzie, and Asher Payton. Welcome to the house. Statements by ministers. The Honorable Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And um, I rise to read the National Ac Accessibility Week statement. Um, National Accessibility Week takes place next week from May 29th to June 3rd. This upcoming week is an opportunity to celebrate the valuable contributions and leadership of Islanders with disabilities and recognize the work of people, organizations, and communities that are removing barriers for people with disabilities. Madam Speaker, Wednesday, May 31st is Red Shirt Day. It's a day of action for accessibility and inclusion. Red Shirt Day is an Easter Seals Canada initiative and was first celebrated in 2019. It takes place on Wednesday of National Accessibility Week each year. I invite all members of the legislature and everyone across PEI to wear, a red, to wear red and show their support for those who are living with disabilities, celebrate, celebrate their achievements, and to commit to help create a fully accessible and inclusive society that honors and values the contributions of people of all abilities in all aspects of life in PEI. What I love most about this week is that it focuses on our abilities. We all have, each and every one of us has so much to offer in so many different ways. And the community partners we work with do so much amazing, an amazing job at celebrating individual abilities. I am honored to have some representatives from the community organizations that support individuals with disabilities in the gallery today. I welcome you. Thank you. Government is committed to continuing to remove barriers and empower Islanders living with disabilities to ensure their inclusion, accessibility, and full participation in society. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The yeah, Honourable Member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Uh, thank you very much for the, the uh, ministerial statement, uh, Minister. And it is an important week, and, and I, I join you in um, you know, both celebrating and, and valuing. I think that was an important word, valuing people um, and their contributions to, um, to whatever. And it's, it, uh, we're, 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 um, we're, we're better with our diversities and our individualities. So um, I'd like to welcome the, the guests here today who came. Um, j just j just a, a couple of, of things, too. I, I, I really think that government should take to take the week and look at the things that need to be done, um, whether it is you know supporting businesses with uh, push buttons, ramps, um, getting out there in the community and seeing um, where our where, where we haven't done a good job, both in the private se sector and, and helping them as well as with the the government run facilities. I look at the outreach center. It's something that I talk about continuously. It, it is not accessible. It's not an accessible facility at the moment. We've talked about that in here. So we need to take this week and figure out a plan to make it accessible. Well, Park Street, it took a while to get the accessibility units up to speed. Um, those were very difficult. So there are some gaps um, that, that the government definitely needs to work on. And I'll continue to push as my job to, to, to keep you accountable to that. But for next week, we'll celebrate the people. We'll celebrate Red Shirt Day or maybe a red tie. I'd like to see that. We'd like to see on the other side some red, some red in the house here. But um, uh, I think we'll celebrate next week's people, and then we'll work on the task later on. Thank you, Minister. Honorable Leader of the... Th oh, 
Oh, sorry. Honorable member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for, for that um, announcement. I will be wearing a red shirt on May 31st, and I'd like to welcome again the people who are from the organizations that, that are representing people living with disabilities. Um, when we think about the fact that everyone adds value in our society, and um, I know that in Nova Scotia and in Ontario and in Manitoba, as well as federally, we have accessibility legislation, which is something I actually heard about quite a bit on the campaign trail, and it's something that I'm looking at how we could incorporate in Prince Edward Island, because that looks specifically at, I mean, that truly makes us an inclusive island, because we look at identifying and remedying all the barriers that people living with, access, with uh, accessibility issues face. And as was mentioned by the member from, Char from Charlottetown West Royalty, when we consider opening or starting, especially new services, I mean, backtracking is an important part of this too because we need to make things accessible for everyone. If they're not accessible for one person, they shouldn't really be open because what does that say? If we're valuing people, then they all should be able to enter a building. And so when we look at a service as the Community Outreach Centre, such an important service, you know, where do we expect people to go if they can't go there and they're experiencing homelessness? So. There's one thing that we know for sure is that uh, when we make things more accessible, we, uh, life improves for everyone. And so um, given that we have a lot of work to do in the province, this is a good start. And I look forward to hearing more about uh, the potential of looking at an Accessibility Act in Prince Edward Island so that we don't just celebrate it in a week, we actually are taking action to make PEI more accessible for everyone. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable member from O'Leary and Burness. Uh, thank you. Uh, I obviously don't have too many family members that actually come to the legislature, but I do happen to have my nieces here today sitting behind me. And uh, Michaela Henderson, uh, she's from, uh, originally from Ontario, but she's living in Halifax at the moment. And uh, she's on PEI. I believe her uh, boyfriend has actually worked with Atlantic Lottery, and uh, he's here at a, at a meeting. And uh, But Michaela has, uh, has no... Uh, uh, stranger to the legislative proceedings, as she used to be a page in the Ontario legislature uh, back in her high school days. And obviously she has some genetic connections with her uncle being a member of the legislature, and her grandfather also served at the legislature. So anyway, welcome, Michaela. <laughs> Great to have you here. Pre presenting and receiving petitions, tabling of documents, the Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you so much, Madam Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table documents as a result of a FOIP request related to the Point de Roche development, including information on buffer zones um, and a lot of correspondence between the department and the developer there on uh, exactly what criteria they used. Um, I referenced this in question period this morning. And I move seconded by Charlottetown Victoria Park that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall carry. Uh, tabling of documents, uh, reports by committees, uh, introduction of government bills, the Honourable Minister of Finance. <coughs> Madam Speaker, I beg leave to introduce a bill to be entitled an amendment to the Income Tax Act, and I move, seconded by the Honourable Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population, that the same be now received and read a first time. Shall carry. Carry. Bill number 14, an act to amend the Income Tax Act, read a first time. Uh, the Honourable Minister of Finance. Thank you, Madam Speaker. An amendment to the Income Tax Act would implement the first steps towards our election commitments outlined in, outlined in Budget 2023. These steps include increasing the basic personal amount, including the associated spousal amount, the low income tax reduction threshold and age credit in 2023 and again in 2024. It will also include the children's wellness tax credit that will increase to $1,000 in 2024. The existing four bracket system that includes the three explicit brackets plus the surtax that acts like a fourth bracket will be replaced with a transparent five bracket system in 2024. 
the proposed brackets are raised and the rates are lowered across the first four brackets. This package of measures will leave more money in the pockets of Islanders. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> Government motions. Orders of the day, government. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Madam Speaker, I move seconded by the Minister of House, Housing, Land, and Communities um, that the number one order of the day be now read. Shall carry. Order number one, consideration of the estimates in committee. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. I move seconded by the Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture that this House do now resolve itself into the Committee of the Whole House to take into consideration the grant of supply to His Majesty. Shall carry. carry, carry. <coughs> Honourable Member from Raldona, please chair Committee of the Whole. Great. The House is now in committee of the whole House to consider the grant of capital supply to His Majesty. Minister, uh, would you like to bring a stranger to the floor? Absolutely. Permission? Granted. Thank you. Not my rules. No shares. Shannon, could you introduce yourself for answers? Yep. 
My name is Shannon Burke, and I'm the Director of Finance and Corporate Services. Thank you. Uh, Minister, do you have anything to uh, share before we get going? I uh, know. I'd just like to welcome. This is uh, Shannon's first agricultural budget. Not her first budget. <laughs> Certainly but her not her first agricultural budget. So I'd like to welcome her aboard. Would you like to give yeah. it handouts? Yeah. We have some handouts here. Minister, would you like to table the handouts? Yes, I would. You may. The member for Charlottetown West Royalty? Yeah, so uh, I think the, they're going to have some handouts. But um, normally we get these in advance. Um, are we? Are these the handouts that would be in the the Big, bigger book? Are we going to get the bigger book before we can, so we can review um, and be be uh, be ready for questions? Um, bigger. Honor, remember that's probably a question uh, for probably the house leaders. We probably could chat about that. Uh, I know the minister can answer uh, his own documents that he's tabling sure. now. So yeah. unless this minister is choosing to table a broader budget thing, that's something you're going to have to ask of of, uh, of others, unfortunately. So I'll ask the I'll ask the minister uh, what are, what is being uh, passed out right now, uh, minister or sure. Shannon? I'll take that. Just given the timelines on on the budget, we weren't able to do the big book where you're used to receiving the book with all the handouts for all the departments together. Um, so I I know the first couple will hand them out at at the very beginning of our sessions. Um, and the ones that you're receiving today are for the Department of Agriculture and also for the Agriculture Insurance Corporation. Cheryl Town West Royalty, is that so that, that is your a, that's that's completely what we'd see in the in the big book. This is this is what we're getting. Everything. Shannon? Uh, I'm not sure if you're getting a big book this year or not. I I haven't seen any communication on that. Could you define a big book? <laughs> so, so uh, just so everybody's aware, um, Charlton West Royalty is asking if there's a budget briefing book. Uh, for many years, there was certainly not. For the last four years, there was a, a background budget briefing book. Uh, Shannon has mentioned that uh, because of the condensed timeline that that hasn't been prepared yet. We don't know if it is or not, but I'm sure that perhaps the Minister of Agriculture can go back and ch check on that afterwards. And then uh, I'm sure the House leaders will follow up with you. Perfect. Just maybe one more question. Charlton West Royalty? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just one more. Can we get these or have some correspondence, at least from your department, to, to make sure that we get these in advance of? I don't think there's anything uh, we would get these anyway, but if we just don't have them, maybe we could have gotten them. I can speak on. Yeah, okay. Minister? I can speak on behalf of my next department for sure. Um, the rest I can't speak on. Do you, would you like to speak? Charlton on? West Royalty. Your next department. Are we going to get these in advance? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chair. All right. We'll start at the Department of Agriculture, Department Management, Corporate Services, appropriations provided for operation of the Office of the Minister and Deputy Minister, and centralized administrative functions for the department. First day, and I get interrupted. Yeah. Is this your first time doing a budget? It is. Well, <laughs> from the seat, from the seat. Department of Agriculture is the first department. Thank you, Chair. Appropriation provided for operation of the Office of the Minister and Deputy Minister and centralized administrative functions for the department. Administration, 35600 Equipment, 3000 Material supplies and services, 38700 Professional services, 15600 Salaries, 536400 Travel and training, 61 Thousand total corporate services six hundred and ninety thousand three hundred. Are there questions? Chair. Leader of the third party. Thank you. Impressive. I don't know if I've ever seen this before that the estimate and the forecast are to the cent exactly the same. That's that's impressive. Well, um, I'll, I'll take that as a <laughs> 
Um, the the last, asks the former minister. The last couple of years, um, a big part of the department management has been taken up, of course, with dealing with the, the potato work crisis. And I'm wondering whether I can ask for, at this point in time, I mean, I know, I, I know it's less critical today than it was at this time last year, but there are still ongoing challenges in, in the sector, as you all know, Minister. And I'm wondering if you can give us a couple of things. Firstly, um, how much, uh, how many resources within your department are still dedicated specifically to dealing with the ongoing potato wart um, concerns that we have, particularly related to seed potatoes? And, and also, um, whether how, how much of the, the budget in, in this department is, uh, in this particular section of the department, is dedicated to that? Minister? So, in terms of this this section of the department, there's um, this this is for the office of the deputy minister and the minister. Um, so obviously, there would be some time spent on on yep. their behalf to this. Um, you'll see in another section where there is some funding towards. It. There are resources towards potato wart, but the actual contingency fund for potato wart sits with general government. Oh, okay. So there's a fund with general government, and the budget sits with them. Leader of the third party? It's just, just unclear on that. So that when you say it sits with general government, that's within the Department of Agriculture, or...? No. 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 I believe it's Department of Finance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Leader of the third party? Would, would the minister care to give us a, a sort of very brief update on where we are with the potato work situation? Um, I, In I, this section? It's not particularly to this section, Chair, but I can... It's up to you, Minister. Do you want... We're on the uh, corporate okay. services. I think the Shannon had mentioned it's the uh, office budget for the Minister and Deputy Minister. Correct. But it's up to you, Minister, if you if you want to give a uh, potato award. I can update. hold the question, or if the Minister wants I'd... to talk to it now. I'm going to talk to it now or later. So Let's okay. wait to the section in, okay. in question. Okay. Looking forward to that. Let's get in a little bit. <laughs> this is more of the uh, pencils and paper section. <laughs> <laughs> this is office supplies. Uh, O'Leary and Burness. Just uh, get the ball rolling here a little bit. Uh, you got a small increase in uh, corporate services spending, about 22000 under salaries there. Uh, I'm assuming that's uh, raised this, or is that a case of uh, a new person has been hired for a short-term contract? or? That's the result of collective bargaining, so just just the increase associated with the negotiations. No new positions. No. Okay, thanks. That's it. That's it. Any other questions? So the section carry. Carry. Total department management six hundred ninety thousand uh, three hundred. Uh, shall it carry? Carry. Agricultural resources. Agricultural resources division. Management appropriations provided for management and support of the Agriculture Resources Division, administration nine thousand four hundred, equipment four thousand, material supplies and services seven thousand eight hundred, professional services seventeen thousand, salaries one hundred and seventy thousand five hundred, travel and training forty four thousand eight hundred, uh, grants uh, one million four hundred sixty five thousand one hundred, total Agriculture Resources Division Division management. One million seven hundred eighteen thousand six hundred. Are there questions? Uh, leader of the third party. I see under the grant section there that the uh, the estimate is the same as it was last year, but the forecast is clearly quite quite different. You know, five or six times what we had estimated. Can you g give us a, a, a rationale for that? Yeah. So um, in the forecast, you'll see the response to Fiona. So there's an additional. Um, 6.075 million in there that relates to the agriculture department's response to Fiona. Um, in 2023 and 2024, the, there is actually a contingency fund set up again with general government uh, related to the Fiona response. Lead of the third party. Thank you. So, uh, of that 6 million, how much of that? Um, will we be able to recover from the federal government? Is there any sense of that? Um, okay. 
we're still working with um, DFAA in terms of how much is, is going to be recovered. So um, we had an estimate, but we don't have firm firm numbers on that. So I can check with the department and kind of see where we're at with that and take, I just don't want to commit to a number without knowing for sure. So we could take that back. Sure. Need a third party? So just to my own, uh, my, my own uh, benefit here, when we're doing accounting like this, and this is down as a provincial, fully provincial expense carried over from last year, and then we receive federal funds to offset that, how, how does that appear on the books? So with respect to this particular program, you would see the revenue estimate with the Department of Justice and Public Safety. Leader of the third party? So that expense that I see from last year uh, booked at 8451000 mm -hmm. that will stay on the books as an expense to the department and then it will be offset at a later date if, if we do get indeed funds from the yeah. feds to, uh, and we'll see that in the revenue side, is that what you're saying? Yeah, so, so there will actually be a matching of, of revenue and expense on, on this. So if we look at the 2023 forecast for justice and public safety, they will have an amount in there related to what they expect to get back from DFAA on this. I just don't have the figure with me. Okay. Yeah. Leave the third parity. Thanks. And again, just to clarify, so the expense goes under the Department of Agriculture and then the revenues would be seen in the Department of Justice, did you say? That's correct. Okay. Public safety. Okay. You know. Right. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Conveniently, same person. Uh, same. Uh, I'm, I'm good Different for this section. Thank you. The member for O'Leary Inverness. So I'm a little confused. So how come some things go under, say, general revenues as far as uh, general government and then, uh, like, unforeseen? So obviously you've got Fiona that you've got a fair bit of money, $7 million that you put into the Fiona support program, but yet uh, under the potato wart, that goes under general revenue. Could you maybe... Minister, you could describe how, how did the decision get made, what's agriculture and what's general revenue, or gen, I shouldn't say general revenue, general government. So I think it has to do with just administration and how they're administering some of these events. And we saw something similar with, with COVID, where the departments um, made the expenditure in, in the year of, and then they moved it to a central contingency. So then the application process on behalf of uh, each department to run programs, they'd have to make sure that it goes through proper channels to access it with general government. O'Leary and Vernes. So you have a breakdown in, in the handouts there a little bit on Fiona agricultural support, set, let's say, seven million. Do you, do you have any kind of a breakdown of where that money, I mean, in, in below that, you have some more information on, you know, so much went to disaster money, some for a building repair replacements, but, uh, but as far as who actually received that money? Like, who were the contractors, or who were the, uh, uh, you know, the building repairs where they were re occurring? Did we get any information on that? The assistance would go to the producer. Um, yeah. So, in a lot of times, you're talking about personal firms or, or corporate firms, and typically we wouldn't disclose that information, but we would. We would have information at the department. I'm just not sure if we, we can bring that back or not, but we can check. O'Leary and Vernes? I guess my point on it's a large amount of money, and I, and I certainly understand that in, when it came to, to comes to disclosure of uh, government write-offs or government grants, or anything that's uh, under $100,000, some, there's some sort of a number there that I, I, I get that you don't have to disclose that. But when you get up into, you know, uh, the amounts of numbers we're talking here in seven million dollars. I, I mean, I'm just wondering how much information we should be able. Is that something we have to go through the VoIP process, or, or is that something that uh, the minister can uh, table in the legislature uh, for any numbers that are say under a hundred thousand okay. dollars? So, so in terms of this program, there's 684 files that this yeah. represents. So. It's a significant number, and we could go back and look at the dollar amount and, and threshold on, on that stuff. O'Leary and Vernes? So, so you will bring something back that, uh, that lists those, say, 500 of the 684 that have received money, and who received it? Or? Uh, we can, we can go back and check and see what we're allowed to disclose. It just depends on whether it's sure. per, names of individual persons. So, O'Leary and Vernes? So you, so how about that? Maybe you just do the corporations versus the individual uh, proprietors, as an example. That might help us a little bit to sort of give a sense of where the money all went. Uh, just once again, it's just a bit of a, a, 
disclosure and transparency. Um, on, uh, so if, if I use the example, if there's one major corporation got a whole lot of money, well, maybe the, the legislature should be aware of that. Uh, if it's somebody that got 50000 for some corn damage, as an example, or a, a, a shed blew down, that's a little different. I, you know, we don't necessarily need to know that. So, so uh, anyway, I, I will uh, stop my question, provided that the minister uh, bring back that information at some point uh, during these proceedings. Charlton and Victoria Park. And I just looking through these notes, um, is this a section where we talk about like a soil health? Um, no, no. Okay, not like that. Okay, I just see the soil first farming marketing strategy here. That's so that's work. It's it's in either the next. I think it's in the next section. Okay, great. I'll hold my question till then, Chair. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Sustainable agriculture. Appropriations provided to assist the farm community with programs and services which support sustainable agriculture practices. Administration, 16900 Equipment, 15700 Material supplies and services, 43900 Professional services, 13200 Salaries, 983300 Travel and training, 13000 Grants, 2937700 Total sustainable agriculture, four million twenty-three thousand seven hundred. Are there any questions? Uh, Cheryl Town, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. I just have a couple of this is the soil health one. Just mm -hmm. to yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Um, when I was out campaigning, I heard um, from actually a few farmers uh, about soil health in particular. And I'm wondering if there's any new money in the budget for any new um, soil health initiatives. Yeah, there is. Do you want um, so, so you'll see some some items gathered, or like sort of scattered throughout the budget. Um, in this particular section, we have an extra um, hundred thousand related to the Healthy Soils Initiative. Um, we also are we've we're entering a new contract with the federal government for sustainable um, the Canadian Agriculture Partnership, and. Within that, we'll have an extra $1.8 million in spending in the current fiscal. So we're currently negotiating a bilateral agreement which defines the programming and the funding associated with the programming for the province. So we haven't confirmed that with the federal government yet, but there will be significant portion of that that would be related to to soil and some, some other items as well. So. Shelton Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. That's that's really great to hear. And one of the, do we do any sort of, and and this isn't inside my realm of expertise. So forgive my if these questions are basic. Please forgive me. Um, do we do any sort of evaluating the programs that we do use for soil health to ensure that they're the optimal programs to be using, or like, and do we have any sort of relationship with other jurisdictions that to kind of figure out best practices and stuff like that? Go ahead, Mitch. That's actually a great question. Um, well, we're with the soil first farming. We're I consider we're almost leaders in in the country in the way we're dealing with uh, our soil health. We do have a lot of improving to do, and uh, and since we um, have irrigation now, uh, that is linked to soil health itself. You can't get irrigation unless you have certain, it's called the SHIP, soil health improvement. You have to be show you're, you're improving your soil. So, um, And we're also continuing the free soil tests at all the labs for your soil health. And um, so lots of things happening in the department to improve soil health. Charlotte and Victoria Perry. Thank you, Chair. I just have one more question. Um, one of the things that I heard from a farmer in um, in the Fernwood area was that they put a decrease in, in earthworms they'd noticed, and I know we see that. I'm wondering, do we see any sort of improvement um, in areas where we're really practicing um, or, or areas where we might be really focusing on soil health? Do we see kind of any improvements from that? Um, I wonder who you're talking about when you say Fernwood. <laughs> I only know one 
And farmer, <laughs> and actually, to be honest with you, I'm saying it was a farmer, but I can't. It wasn't the farmer we're thinking of. So okay, okay. I can't. I can't remember who I was talking to who told me that. To be honest with you. Okay. Well, obviously, we're the, there's one person we're connecting, but it's not. Um, well, with regenerative agriculture, which we are pushing through soil health. Um, Regenerative agriculture is all about the composite of soil and keeping the uh, carbon and the organic matter in the soil. So when we, actually with our uh, livestock strategy, it's really focused on regenerative agriculture where uh, you get that deep roots, you get the healthy soil, you get the organic matter. That's where you see the life in the soil. And the more life you can have in the soil, the better the soil is going to be. And that's where... Uh, I think the, the industry as a whole is looking at that as um, I pro we probably got away from it for years, but now there's a real change, a real mindset in uh, sustainability, and that's what the, the, all the funding is based around, is sustainability, and it all circles back to the composite of our soil and soil health. So. Good. Thank you, Good Jeremy. Good question. Thank you. O'Leary Inverness. Minister, under sustainable agriculture, that, the ALICE program falls under that. Um, are you going to increase the budget on the ALICE program? <laughs> Minister. Going to double it. Yes, sir. Oh, well, I, Just about double it. I'm, I'm a little heavy on that. It's shy. So, okay, so but it says in the estimates you just gave out here, you've got uh, the ALICE program down for uh, the same amount of money as, uh, in fact, less money than last year. So we've... You What's look, up with that? Oops, sorry. <laughs> so if you look a little further, um, the $1.8 million that I spoke about earlier, um, there is a requirement under the new sustainable cap program um, where 50% of the increase is allocated to uh, Alice. Um, they call it Ralph, I think. Um, and so you'll see a little lower in the handouts. There's an extra 600 and some thousand okay. allocated to this this section that relates to so, the new programming that we can't commit to until the bilateral agreement is signed with the feds. So right. we just didn't mm -hmm. assign it to the program, but it so, will have to go. So there. this is federal money? No, no, no. It's shared. It's shared. It's shared. It's cap money. So <laughs> because of the election, this the other provinces are already signed on. We're going through the process of approval through... Uh, executive council here, so it, we should be relatively soon. So the federal, the federal uh, government took basically our Alice program and called it Ralph, and <laughs> it's basically Alice. And all, all provinces are now. Can we get a Blois now... program somewhere here? Or are we going to get? <laughs> What's that? Is there a Blois program yeah. out there to put some more money into this stuff? <laughs> Valeria and Vernes. So, so how much money is the province extra putting in? I mean, so so as it looks from uh, for past money of Alice, you, you're 10,000 less, but you're increasing more of it through the federal program. What portion of the federal program, that's it's Ralph, <laughs> is uh, so 40 percent of that? So okay, so that is an increase then, but yeah. not double from your pocket. Yeah. It's or from our department's pocket. And the a, Alice, I have to point out, uh, it was a little bit underspent, but that was basically because of Fiona last year. Uh, a lot of the projects got shut down early, so uh, the funding is going to be the program. The, they're still good to go, but it just has to go into this calendar year. So. O'Leary and Vernes. So when when we come to so now we've got a pot of money that's more for the Alice Ralph or Blois whatever the program is <laughs> going to be called. Uh, so how is that money distributed? Is it is it based on an increase on the amount of money that they can claim per acre, or is it just you're saying there's more budget there for more acres to go under the Alice program under the existing uh, fee structure that you pay? There's there's more acreage, and. Uh, and we also revamped Alice. There's a new, uh, there's a board now for Alice, which brought in uh, producers, uh, bar people from environment, and uh, and Adam McLean is actually government. He's heading that board. So um, they're changing this. Uh, they're looking at options to change how we're how we're paid. Uh, the old idea of taking land out, of, being paid to take land out of production. I'd ra we'd rather see it being paid to taking carbon out of the uh, out of the atmosphere. So, uh, if we can, 
they're looking at switching how how farmers are going to get paid for their atlas. Hmm. Oh, they're in Vernes. So okay, so you're going to add more acres, but you're but you're not adding more incentives per acre, is what you're saying. And sound like you're going to make it even a bit more complicated uh, in uh, being able to do that. <laughs> so I've, see, my issue is is that. I, I don't see any incentive in adding more. You're not paying enough money to take agricultural land uh, that's risky out of production. So if you're not going to add enough incentives, how are you going to spend all this money? I mean, in the end of the day, I'm not seeing a massive uh, uptake of this program anymore is what I'm hearing from farmers. Right. So Definitely. maybe you can explain how do we get more money in the pockets of farmers to encourage them to do more as well as to... Uh, uh, give more to those that are still doing it. Oh, absolutely, you're right. And it has to be lucrative, and that's the way you're going to get that uh, to be lucrative is by capturing carbon. And it's not, it's, it's not here today, but it's coming. So if we can pay more to take that land out of production now, but that's transformed into carbon, carbon capture, capture in the future once we get get to that point. And that's why this board is set up and uh, you have environmentalists, you have farmers on there uh, to come uh, come away with the best solution. O'Leary and Vernes? That sounds to me to be more bureaucratic and sounds like it would be a bit more cumbersome. Um, and so does this board have the authority to pay more per acre of uh, land that comes out of production beyond the buffer zone? I'll have to bring that back. I, I'm not sure. Okay. O'Leary and Vernes? Uh, I'll finalize my question just in more of a statement, I guess, just in saying that that's, that's imperative to the issue here. Right. You know, you, you, have, you have to make it the, the incentives there to do that. And that's the, that's the issue that I was getting uh, from farmers, that it's not enough anymore. It's badly outdated. And it sounds to me, I think, as minister, you need to make sure that it doesn't become more cumbersome and more bureaucratic and figure out ways that you can make sure that it does actually put more money in the pockets for the farmers that do take that land out of production that even are currently doing it. Um, uh, so, uh, so I just wanted to end with that. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Do we note it? Any leader of the third party? Thanks, Chair. Uh, uh, ongoing soil health studies been almost 20 years now I think since it was started and typically the updates come every three years and we're quite far over date you know, like we're out of date with that can you tell us when we're going to get the next round of results on that data uh, that's a good question uh, it must be due reasonably soon it's over because uh, yeah I think it was 2020 when we had the last one so I'll have to get back to that. Uh, I'll be interested to see that as well, to see if we're making improvements. Leader of the third party? Yeah, me too, because, I mean, it did look like we had bottomed out and that things were starting perhaps to starting to improve, yep. but we didn't have enough data to sort of know whether this is a trend or whether it was just a little blip last time. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that, Minister. I think that's a... It's a very important, like there's not many times we have a 20-year-old study that can follow right. the, same, the yep. same information and give us updates like that. So I hope that's coming. Um, the Agricultural Stewardship Program, I see we're down, and again, this might be like the Alice Program that O'Leary and Burness was just talking about, that it looks on the book as though nothing has changed. But I know that that program is oversubscribed, like with, almost within minutes, that that program is gone. And I see that we haven't increased it by a cent. So is that indeed the case? Yeah, I, I would assume that most of the program budgets would be reviewed um, and fund extra funding allocated where needed with the, with the new sustainable cap. Leave it to the third party. Uh, I would strongly argue that that's a place where we do need extra funding. If you speak to any farmer who wants to access that program, they're sitting at their computer at 12.01 oh, yeah. or whatever it is on the day it comes. And at 12.03, it's all gone. So I've got a question to the minister on that. Did, have you advocated for more funds for the stewardship program? Well, all the programs are increasing by 25% with the new cap agreement, that sustainable cap. So the feds and provinces have agreed to increase by 25%. Okay. So we, hopefully we'll sign. And I'm getting those calls, too, because they're sitting there. <laughs> as soon as cap is approved, uh, 
the new funding agreements will be open and uh, everyone will be eligible then. Leader of the third party. Thanks. So just, just for clarity on that, Minister, all of these grants um, within the sustainable agriculture section, they will all be increased by 25% as a result of the cap agreement? Not necessarily. I don't. I don't have the numbers that were proposed for the new programming because they have to be agreed upon by Fed and provincial. But I suspect the the agreement will be finalized soon, and we'll have an announcement on on where they'll be allocated. Leader of the third party. Thanks. Uh, under this section in the grants, there's uh, one of them using feed additives in ruminants, uh, livestock diets, the research trial. And I'm assuming that's. You're referring there to the, the seaweed additive that, that yes. was developed here on, on PEI out west mm -hmm. and seems to be showing some very promising results. Um, are you funding that particular uh, endeavor? Uh, and yep. if so, to what extent? Yes. Uh, I don't have the details on, but I think it's with the uh, Dalhousie Agricultural Campus uh, yes. Partnership. We do have one with them. Yeah, program. and they're, they're doing the study and we're funding it. So. Leader of the third party. Thanks. Uh, I mean, we know that the feds um, are mandating, through, you know, in our net zero plan, a global net zero plan, um, reductions in agriculture, which are quite significant over the next little while, 10 or 15 percent, I believe, and, um, by 2030, and then 25 to 40 percent, haven't figured that out by 2040. That's, those are significant reductions, particularly when we're talking about uh, use of fertilizers, nitrogen fertilizers, which is by far the biggest contributor of agriculture to global warming molecules. And I'm wondering what you are doing um, to advocate on behalf of island farmers to make sure that those mandated reductions at the federal level are going to allow the farmers here on Prince Edward Island to carry on <coughs> doing what they're doing um, and meet those targets at the same time. Uh, that's a great question, and of course I've uh, just recently got back to this chair, and uh, we do have our FPT, which I, I wasn't a part of last year, but uh, our FPT is in uh, July, uh, and um, let me tell you, it's, uh, it's a huge conversation, and uh, um, we're pushing as all provinces are on making it feasible for farmers, you know, um, you know to get to, to attain those targets, uh, we have to do it through uh, innovation and technology is, is the main way we are going to do it. And uh, so through our cap funding, the, the new sustainable cap, you're going to see a lot more uh, funding on precision agriculture and no-till equipment and uh, that way you can re reduce uh, your inputs as much as possible uh, probably faster than uh, any other way so that's the way we're and the other provinces are, are pushing that as well so it was, it's a pretty big agreement the sustainable cap and uh, there's a real focus so much focus that they insisted that is sustainable be part of the name so Leader of the third party. Thanks, Chair. Uh, you mentioned no-till uh, there, Minister, and I, I know here on PEI that's a, it's a challenge for farmers because unlike out west where root crops are less of the production, uh, you know, it's a percentage of, of agricultural production than it is here, um, you, can't you, know, you can't grow potatoes. You can't use a bunch of stuff that we grow here on a large scale that you can't do with no-till. Uh, and I'm wondering, how much, well, I guess, again, just for my own benefit, um, how much no-till agriculture is going on on PEI in terms of percentage of the acres that we farm? Um, Shannon just pointed out to me <laughs> that we are, she reminded me about the new, uh, we have a new department. Division. Division, uh, Agriculture Climate Adaptation. And uh, it's... Uh, how much funding are we? There is an extra seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars in funding, um, just towards creation of that, which includes grants. But we'll get there in a couple of of sections right. um, related to helping to meet climate climate adaptation that's, goals. That's our goal to help meet meet our targets. 
Do the third party? Right, I think I'm good for this section. Thank you, Chair. Shall the section carry? Carry. Agriculture industry development. Appropriations provided to assist agriculture industry development for producers and agri-processors to meet market and production opportunities. Administration, 24500 Equipment, 6100 Material supplies and services, 44500 Professional services, 3500 Salaries, 1144600 Travel and training, 38800 Grants, 4093100 Total agriculture industry development, 5355100 Are there any questions? O'Leary and Verness. This was a file I was pretty active on my time was the dead stock disposal services. Maybe just give me an update. I see there's some stability, and it sounds like things are working out pretty good, but uh, I'm always uh, curious to see how that's going. And uh, that's, that's a good question, and it's something that uh, <laughs> even when it was your time, it's, it's continues, continues to be uh, a main issue. Uh, that, uh, it's, it's working well right now, knock on wood, but... Uh, it's it's a fragile system, and uh, that's why we're we're looking at a biorefinex. Uh, we're doing a hundred thousand for a study on uh, feasibility study on uh, possibly uh, biorefinex or dead stock, and uh, to turn it into electricity and uh, organic matter. So. O'Leary and Verdes. Yeah, not, and that I was in discussions on that as well. So is that going to be at the energy from waste plant that you're looking at to include that in? No, it'd be it'd be different. Be a, O'Leary Inverness. So it'd be a, a different site, and will that also include the uh, dealing with the waste from the beef plant itself? Uh, because that was a massive cost to them. Yes, yes, and and seafood waste and. Uh, yeah, good. Yes. Yeah. So. Well, uh, it's a different pro process than uh, the energy from waste. Uh, it's, uh, okay, that, that's it for me for now. Lead of the third party. Thanks. So how much of the funding is work done in this uh, agricultural industry uh, de development department? How much of that is devoted to um, increasing crop diversity, and how much is, is de de devoted to developing new markets for crops? I, there, there have been some changes, so just bear with me. Yep. I believe crop diversity is in the next section. I think that's in climate adaptation. Um, yep. That's, that's in the next in the next section. Okay. Uh, Leave to the third priority. Thanks. Um, there's been a sort of ongoing saga with the WA Grains plant in Summerside, and I know a big part of the opportunity that that facility represented was um, to increase the diversity of, of crops that farmers grow here and, and offer both um, processing and storage capacity for things like pulses and, and uh, other, other crops that are not grown in such high quantities here. Is there any update on the future of the WA Grains facility? Uh, it's it's been sold uh, to an agricultural company, private company, um, dealing with livestock feed. Live, sorry. Uh, a livestock feed company has oh, purchased okay. it. Yeah, uh, it was looked at by uh, our grain elevators and um, and several other. Entities, uh, but uh, just didn't quite suit. Uh, wasn't wasn't feasible to do the switch over and for the the cost of the building. So uh, someone came in and purchased it from Finance PI. Okay. Right. Leader of the third party. Thanks. Uh, so in terms of, you mentioned a minute ago, I asked a question about diversity in uh, in crops. Is is that all? Should I hold all those questions for the next section or? The funding is in the next section. Funding for, for in increasing diversity. Yeah. Okay, I'll I'll hold my questions to the next section. Uh, Charlottetown Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is I recognize a combo between two different um, departments, but I just an idea that was thrown my way that I'm curious if there's been ever any kind of discussion. 
you know the um, the greenhouses near Upton Park, where they the where they grow marijuana, or they I don't know if they still do. Do they still? Are they using all of those greenhouses right now to grow marijuana? I, do you know? I, I only know this from my economics and growth <laughs> and tourism days. Uh, they're not using the whole facility, but they still are growing marijuana. Thank you, Chair. And, and the reason I'm asking this here is just, just seeing the different, the Community Food and Security and Agriculture Awareness Program, uh, Community Food Security, just kind of looking at those. So it might not be the right section to ask this. It might not, it might not be a section to ask this. But one of the ideas that someone threw at me was, given those greenhouses aren't being used for that right now, if they're not being used, if the province would ever consider opening those up to either actually growing things like lettuce and vegetables for islanders for free or using allowing islanders to come into that space and use it to grow food just to improve food security um, on the island um, I, I i don't think that would be an option for that uh, facility just because uh, i think there's so much restrictions with uh, medical and being medical marijuana being grown that cfia and Health Canada, it's, uh, it's pretty restricted access and things like that. But uh, we do have funding um, for. Um, Can yeah, yep. uh, you go ahead, Sharon. Yep. So we do have some additional funding in in the budget for community fridge, uh, community fridges to to look at an umbrella organization. Um, to kind of manage who would work with the or individual organizers of each. I believe it's 150000 but we may have passed that section. Cheryl Tan, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And, and so would that be like a financial donation to community fridges, or would that be supplying them with fresh local produce? I, th I think it's more for to establish new new fridges, new, new areas. Cheryl Tan, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And do we see those as kind of temporary measures while we ensure that, because we know that the best way to er eradicate food insecurity is to put money in people's pockets. Mm -hmm. So do we see these as permanent investments or are these kind of temporary measures until we get food security under control by 2025? Right. I think it's one of these measures that we're going to continue to uh, t to look at year by year to make sure if, uh, if the need is there, we'll continue to do it. Charlotte and Victoria Park. Uh, thank you, Chair. Is this a section for funding in agriculture in the classroom? Did you ask these questions already? Mm -hmm. Sure. The details here. I think that's Linda's. Yeah, I think it was we, earlier. We already passed it, but uh, oh. I, I oh, do. No, it is. no, actually, it is. Yeah. It's here. There was okay. seventy-seven thousand. Yep. Seventy-seven thousand. Charlton Victoria okay. Park. So um, we receive less than our counterparts in other parts of Can in other Atlantic provinces, and I'm just wondering if we foresee increasing the funding for this program, or have we increased the funding for this program? Uh, definitely, and uh, I think per capita we're, we're not too too much different, but uh, it's something that's important, and I know uh, before 2019 we did a pilot project. We put um, hydroponics, uh, grade three classes got, uh, I think there was 13 of them we purchased hydroponics where they could grow their own salads, produce lettuce, tomatoes, <coughs> and... Uh, few other vegetables and uh, it was we're gonna start that up again and uh, I think that that's an age that uh, I remember going to the classroom and they harvested it and they were eating their their uh, salad and it just uh, it's an important age and it's important that uh, they we teach them where their food comes from and uh, it's something that's so simple and uh, but definitely uh, agriculture in the classroom, even to attract uh, future farmers or future employees or uh, to to the industry is important. So we'll continue to uh, to work on that. 
If, Shell Town Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Just just one more comment on that. I agree. Having been in the classrooms where they're doing that, they're so excited about growing food. And even as an educator, before they set that program, maybe not necessarily before the program, but I wasn't aware of the program and growing food with my grade one students or grade three students mm -hmm. is something that they love to do and get so excited about and we can never underestimate the importance of that in we, rippling into the future. So we probably should put it in every grade three classroom, shouldn't we? Yeah. Can we put it in every grade three classroom, Minister? I, I will commit to that. You don't? I will. Well, you will. Yeah. Thank you. She said we'll get the money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, leader of the third party. Uh, thanks again, Chair, for letting me back in. Um, so we just got some stats yesterday um, on the agricultural sector, um, the yearly stats on where, where we are, and them, they look pretty promising. Um, and I note that the budget paper in the economy uh, says that the value of international exports is, is all exports, not just agricultural. Um, increased 17% last year, and, and we're almost at $2 billion. That's, a, that's an all-time high. And I'm wondering if you know what the value of the, of the, the agricultural component of those exports is? Well, as, a, as if we put our two top agriculture industries, our potato and our dairy, if we put those two together, um, it's almost $2 billion of economic spin-off of those two industries. So you put all, all the agriculture industries as a whole. Uh, I don't have our economist <laughs> uh, in the department anymore, but uh, it would be in the billions of dollars. So economic spin-off of all our, our, our industry. Right. Leave the third party? Yeah, it was specifically, though, about the agri the value of the agricultural exports. I'm not, I know right. I obviously realize that it you know, filters through the economy and it has, it has domino effects in all kinds of positive ways, but in terms of the value of our agricultural exports? I don't have that number. Oh. Okay. I'll have to bring that back. Leave the third party? Uh, and we all know, obviously, the price of food has gone up everywhere, you know, sh shockingly fast over the last couple of years, particularly the last year. And uh, that doesn't always, of course, flow down to the primary yeah. producer, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but we do see that um, in 2022 that almost all agricultural commodities saw a pretty big, you know, it was a healthy increase. And are there any estimates from your department or forecasts from your department about whether those prices are going to be able to be sustained this year? I mean, I realize there are volatilities and global marketplaces and things that we don't know or understand, but what, what's the latest forecast on that? So with the, uh, the input costs are coming down modestly, uh, with fuel, diesel, of course, being one of the biggest input costs in agriculture. It's uh, probably half the price that it was last year, but unfortunately, uh, fertilizer has gone up, so... Um, It'll, it'll be a modest, uh, the input cost will be modestly decreased this year, but uh, whether that will have an economic impact to the price of food uh, in the near future, I'm not 100% sure, and, uh, and uh, we'll have to wait and see. All right, sure. I understand, I understand that. Chair. Leader of the third party. So in this section, the budget um, mentioned $250,000 of money for controlled environment farming. And we spoke about this in, the, in our briefing yesterday. It was a new phrase to me. But I mean, we're talking about uh, greenhouses and tunnels and hydroponics and stuff like that. Um, so is that, that is entirely funded through this division, is it? Mm -hmm. okay. It's the next division, actually. Oh, next, next. Oh, the next division. Yep. OK, I'll, uh, I'll hold my questions on that for now. Um, there's an increase in grants in this division of uh, about a million dollars from last year, and I'm wondering if you could tell us what the, the, those extra million dollars is going to yep. specifically. Yep. So what we did with the additional sustainable cap funding of the 1.8 million, we divided it just among the three divisions that deliver most of the cap programs. So there's 616,000 additional in here related to that. Um, there's an extra $250,000 to improve 
um, quality of housing for temporary foreign workers working in the agriculture industry. Um, and then, as we mentioned, 150000 towards the support for community fridges. And then we have an extra 25000 in there to help promote local um, food. Leader of the third party. Thank you. I appreciate those details. Thank you. Um, you mentioned there about, I think it was 250000 if I caught it right, to improve housing for TFWs here on, on PEI. Yeah. Can you give us some idea of how that is distributed and, and how, um, a, a far, presumably this is just specifically for TFWs working in the agricultural sector, is that, it? That's correct. Right. So um, how, how would a farmer qualify for that? So we're, we're just looking at the details of this now, but we're hoping to assist um, farmers and improving maybe with equipment or um, to just improve the quality of some of the housing that's on um, on farms um, to help make them more secure um, and comfortable for our temporary farm workers that will assist our farmers in, in recruiting them because they're a big part of the industry obviously um, but in terms of extra details beyond that we would have to take it's something we're probably going to continue to grow, and 250 is just a start where we can, for agriculture, because it's, TFWs are not just agriculture, it's uh, our whole economy. So um, we want to work with the Department of Health on uh, improving the, the standards and uh, anything we can do for our agriculture industry to to support uh, our TFWs, and uh, I know whether it's kitchen space, whether it's living space, and just improve the improve the quality improve the quality of uh, living living here. So, leader of the third party, uh, I know some TFWs are looked after really well, uh, oh, and they absolutely. come here and. You know, they are the, the process to bring them here is is good. There are no extra costs that they have to shoulder themselves. Their families are well taken care of, and etc. 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 But that's not true f for all of them. So I'm wondering, in this 250 thousand new dollars that we are providing to improve housing, because housing is one of the areas where there have been some concerns across the country, and specifically here on PEI. Um, what, where I would find the standards for that. I'm just trying to figure out how someone would apply for that and what standards we're aiming for that would be um, acceptable. So Department of Health does the inspections of all TFW's homes, so they have the they have that in their department. So um, I think we would probably partner with them and, and look at where the Gaps are. I think that's what we're trying to, with this 250, fill in the gaps and to try to improve it. I think it'll continue to grow as well. Sure. Leader third party. Thanks, Chair. Again, just for my own understanding here, just to, to how this process works. So, is would that money be distributed based on Health PEI coming to do an inspection and discover that something is substandard and that it needs to be updated, and then money would be given out at that point, or is this somebody who has TFWs living and working on their farm, and they can come to government and ask for money to improve? Which, which of those two is it? Uh, uh, we're going with the proactive, you know, uh, not the reactive. Uh, we want, you know, we want to uh, help improve, not <laughs> ones that fail. We're not um, necessarily we, not that we won't help them, but it's we're trying to improve our system. So, and we don't have that data right now from the Department of Health. Uh, on we we don't see the um, inspections, right? Leave it third party. Uh, so I'm wondering whether you've who. Not, not a question I imagined I was going to be answering because it, it, I didn't know about this 250,000. I can't find it in the handout here at all. But for me, it's a, it's a critical issue. And we passed re legislation recently, although as far as I know, it still hasn't been proclaimed. But I'm wondering whether you have consulted with people like the Cooper Institute on 
what exactly the standards for this housing should look like and therefore are we distributing this funds where and when it needs to be given. Yeah, we're not going to do this on the fly. We, you know, we're going to make sure we do it right, and we'll definitely be including the Cooper Institute and uh, the way we... Um, and other jurisdictions, I know Quebec have agriculture, have have their own set of uh, standards for agricultural workers, so I think we want to get there. Uh, we want to be leaders in this as well, uh, in our department. So. Third part, do you have... Uh, more on this, or uh, yeah, just a couple of more things on this, just because it's new information, I think, for all of us in this house, I would imagine. And I, I, I hope maybe two more, I can move on to others. Uh, sure, yeah. on the list and then come and back I, to you. I, I, for sure. Um, so, the two hundred and fifty thousand dollars will that will that money go directly to farmers, or is this given that this is public funds that are being dispersed here? Um, does the province own any of, or would they end up owning either a portion, a share, or an entirety of the housing that would be provided for TFWs, or does this go as a grant to farmers? So, um, I, I don't think we're going to be building infrastructures, but that being said, because this is new funding in this budget, not in the existing budget, because it's $250,000, the, this program will have to go through Treasury Board approval and the details of it would have to be approved at that level and off to Executive Council. So um, in terms of committing to what the program would look like exactly here, we're, I don't think we're in a position to do that until it's gone through appropriate approvals. So, but definitely things we'd be factoring in. Okay. Leave the third party. Last one on this. Th thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. Typically we have... A, at the height of the season, a thousand or so TFWs here working on, P, uh, on PI, not again all in the agricultural sector, but the bulk of them are. Any sense of how many TFWs we should expect this year? You say this is something that's going to grow into the future. Do we have a number on that? And if so, uh, uh, how do you get those forecasts? Is that through the LMIA and at the federal level? That, that's something uh, I've had this conversation with my department, and we want to start collecting data. and. Uh, so we know uh, exactly how many are coming. And uh, there, we do have access through uh, Department of Health and um, immigration on, on who's, how many are coming, but uh, we want to have more detailed data, and that's what we're going to coll start collecting to make an informed decisions going forward. Charlton, what's your idea? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for your time. Good to see you. Um, just had some questions on the, the community fridge. I'm glad to see there's there's funding in, in there, uh, obviously, for community fridges. Um, that was 150000 correct? Correct. Okay. So, and, and as you were talking about that, I think the minister said it was to establish new fridges. I think right? it's to... the. The first piece would be to establish an umbrella organization that helps to um, manage all the, ex the, well, not manage, but um, where all the existing fridges and organized, yeah, coordination, I guess that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, and then there would be funding to the individual community fridges. Okay. Cheryl Taylor, what's your all So under that umbrella that would be run from your department, correct? Is it? I believe we're looking for an organization. Okay. So the, because every every sorry chair um, every fridge is run differently and um, they have their own structures and are done by the community. Um, I'm just uh, like an organization like the United Way might be a good place to to kind of have those initial discussions. Um, so the money that's coming out of it, is there any is there any money in government now um, before this fund was set out for community fridges? There was some COVID. money from the Department of Agriculture during COVID, um, and there was some additional um, funding sent out as inflationary incentives to community fridges, and um, there was also, and I don't have the exact dollar amount, that was sent out to, to assist with funding, I believe, to grow a station for community fridges. 
Charlton Westerology. I guess I'm just trying to figure out where the funding for the community fridges that have sprung up quite rapidly is going to lie within the province. Um, and that's that's important that that we we make sure it's it's centralized because I wouldn't have I wouldn't have thought it would have been agriculture. Well, we're good people here. Yeah. <laughs> but it's good. Minister, have you talked to um, to know the numbers? Um, have, would you consider talking to the Minister of Social Development and, and bringing her in on this? A lot of her clients potentially use use the community fridge um, to so to know the need. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. I'm I'm excited about this fund, and uh, I I, um, I just think it, it really needs to be done right. And we have to look at that that number, not creating new fridge. We have to get the funding to people so they can spend money on food, and not not the other way around. Not from the minister just said it. Be proactive, not from bottom up, but but to get people out of poverty. And we we this is important, but we also have to look at other factors. So thank you, Chair. Shall the Board and Kinkora. Thank you, uh, Chair. I'm not quite sure if I'm in the right area or not, but um, I'm curious, can you give us an update? We're talking about development, right? Can you give us an update on where we are in the seed issue and potatoes with the, with the United States? Uh, is that, where would that fall under? Honorable member, uh, we, that's in another health. section. We chatted about that. Pardon me? It's in another, the minister had mentioned that it's in a further section. Okay. If he can point that out, Chair, when he gets to that section of the... Let's hope he does. Yeah. I know the leader of the third party is definitely going to point it out. Shall the section carry? Carried. Carried. Agriculture climate adaptation. Appropriations provided to support programs and services designed to assist the farm community in adapting to industry challenges associated with climate change. Administration, 8,600. Equipment, 15,600. Material supplies and services, 20,200. Professional services, 13,200. Salary, 726,800. Travel and training, 13,000. Grants, 1,825,500. Total agriculture climate adaptation, 2622900 Are there any questions? The leader of the third party. So this is a brand new section, and uh, happy, happy to see it, of course. And I'm wondering if you can explain what sorts of things will be covered on this, under this section, just so I know where to direct my questions. So... Um this is commitment on helping our farmers continue to be leaders in our climate efforts, of course. And uh, I've said since the start, uh, farmers can't carry the weight of this on their own and uh, our climate to, to reach these targets. So uh, this section will ensure guidance and support uh, for them throughout this process. And staffing is underway, and we look forward to working with some of the existing uh, divisions already. Um, as well with the Department of Environment will be a big part of this uh, This as well on, on helping agriculture. This is where our, our partnership with environment is really strong and uh, ho hopefully continue to do that. So. And this is where our ALICE program is going to be. Uh, mm -hmm. The, yeah, the policy, the funding for ALS is in the other section, but the policy direction um, would be in here. And so you would have uh, Adam McLean is, is in this section, and it will help lead some of the initiatives here. Great. Leader of the third party. Yeah, I know Adam's a great guy. I have all kinds of respect for him and the work that he's done um, as a farmer here on the PEI and, and, and now in the department. He's a great asset to your department. I'm glad he's there. And I, I see there's a near tripling of the grants in this section. I mean, even though it's a new section, there was about 650,000 distributed in grants last year. Sorry, 730 was the forecast. Um, and we're looking at almost 2 million this year. So I was wondering what was previously funded and what is going to be newly funded with this budget. So we had a number of programs that existed in other divisions that we've moved over here to, so we've added those numbers in just for comparison purposes um so the bee pollination expansion program um, is in this section um, we also have the perennial crop program um, and organic industry development so those are the okay. existing programs that fall under this now 
and then we have additional funding. So we have the additional 616,000 related to the new um, sustainable cap program. Um, and we have an extra 100,000 to go towards crop diversification and um, 250,000 towards controlled environment farming. Then there's there's all sorry there's also an additional three hundred and eighty thousand that we put in for for grants that will be geared towards um, climate adaptation programming so new programming and that's all provincial funding. Right. Okay. The other third party. Thank you. So I, I appreciate that list. So I've got a few questions probably on on each of those things you've just mentioned. Um, the the B expansion program. How are we doing with that? Because I know the ultimate goal here is to be, if I can put it this way, self-sufficient in bees and you not have to import bees at all with the concurrent risks that, that uh, are associated with that. So where are we with the expansion program? Uh, it, well, <laughs> continues to be uh, a growing industry, um, but it's, it continues to have its challenges. Uh, overwintering here is is... Is, seems to be, <laughs> we get two steps forward and uh, one backwards every every year. And uh, um, but we're making strides. Uh, we have a night, a really good working relationship with the pollinators association and uh, the beekeepers, and uh, they're really progressive and uh, are trying to do uh, <coughs> try to make improvements and. Uh, uh, it'd be nice that someday we become self-sufficient, um, but uh, we really have to try to make strides on the overwintering to get there. So, the third party. Yeah, I mean that overwintering die uh, kill off is it's, it's it's awful and and unpredictable as you say. You know, sometimes you have low percentage, and other years you'll have 50, 60, or more percent. And uh, I, I don't know what the figures are for this year. Do you have a sense of how the bees overwintered last winter? Uh, I did. I did uh, it's not at the top of my head. I have to bring it back. It was something like, it wasn't much better than the year previous year. So, okay. yeah. Okay. Leader of the third party? <clears throat> I, know, I mean, I know we can reestablish these hives, re hives relatively quickly, but it costs money, and that's, that's mm -hmm. partly where this bee expansion program money's come from. So well, you, I think you used the phrase two steps forward and one step, one step back. Um, presumably we, are, we have increased despite the challenges in the sector and you've described a couple of them. Um, we, we've increased the number of hives that we have here on PEI. Is it fair to say that over the last two years? Oh, definitely. We have, yeah. Leader of the third party. So where are we in terms of the percentage of the of the absolute need that we have here for hives on PEI? Are we at fifty percent? Are we at sixty or what? Uh, I don't, I'd have to bring that back. I don't have the exact detail. I know we are uh, importing some bees uh, right now. They're they're in Ontario inspecting hives that are coming here. So. Leader of the third party. Can you tell us? Uh, presumably, there's a strategic plan here to get from where we were a couple of years ago and the and the risks involved in importing bees from particularly from Ontario um, to the situation where we have all of the bees that we need particularly for blueberries but there are other crops as well apples in, increasingly here mm -hmm. on PEI important crop um, where how long you imagine it's going to take for us to become a hundred percent self-sufficient oh. <laughs> one thing I can <laughs> honestly tell you about this is a strategic plan is almost with the uncertainty of winter losses it's, it's pretty tough to have uh, a strategic plan that will give you that date uh, is what I'm in my personal opinion is it's going to be hard to give that number a few years ago when I we first started this expansion program I I'd hope we'd have it by now self-sufficient but uh, we're not so uh, I don't I, I just can't give a date or a time frame for that. Leader of the third party. So what I hear you say minister is there is no uh, and I understand there are, are variables here that we can't control and important variables like like die-off but are do we have like do you have a goal in mind like is 
two years from now, five years from now? Like, it, does the department have that? Uh, well, that's what uh, Cam is working on. Yeah, Cameron, uh, sure. Cameron, and uh, uh, he's working hard trying to to uh, to build this so we can be self-sufficient. But I haven't been uh, briefed by Cam since I've gotten back to this uh, to give any kind of uh, date. So I'll have to bring that back. Two more, the other third party, and then we'll, and I'll come back to you. Sure. Okay. Um, so obviously, f at least for the meantime, we're going to have to continue to import bees here. Um, can you give us an update on the importation protocols that are in place? Are they more stringent than they were in previous years? Uh, I believe they're the same as last year, and um, yeah, uh, and I'm not sure the numbers, but uh, the protocols are the same. Leader of the third party. Uh, okay, um, I'd love to get some details on what the pro importation protocols are, if I can ask you to bring that back for, for uh, when, when you're on the floor tomorrow, if possible. Uh, not tomorrow, sorry, excuse me, Tuesday is our, our ledge tomorrow. Um, Doesn't sound like <laughs> <laughs> This is agriculture. Um, there was some question, and I, I mean Cameron would be the person to answer this, is he, he has the the depth of knowledge on this topic that I, do, I don't have, but whether the number of bees that we require here to pollinate the crops that we that we depend on, the, or that the, um, are bee dependent, pollinator dependent, um, again, particularly blueberries, and of course we bring them in for the week or two that we need them and then they're, then they're gone. But if we were to become self-sufficient in bees, we have to, have, they, they live here all year on, on our island. And there was some question as to whether we have sufficient foliage, that's not the right terminology, but to support that bee population through through the year. Do you know if that's been established yet as to whether we actually have enough to keep the number of bees we need for that very short season where we need a ton of them, um, that, that we can support them for the rest of the year? I don't have that information. I'll have to bring that back. Can I also ask that you could bring whatever Cameron has on that back? Thank you. Uh, O'Leary and Verness? Yeah, just a uh, leader of the third party sort of went over some of my questions regarding, but my understanding is we haven't really even moved the needle on the demand for what bee importation is required in PEI. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to see increases in blueberry production. I think that's, you know, will continue. And berry production usually only improves as, as fields mature. So, you know, in the, in the end, it, is your strategy working, and do you need to do something that's different to uh, to try to somehow increase the the amount of hives that are required? Uh, yeah, no, we, we do have to uh, keep. I think we have moved the needle. It's just uh, pretty small. The, if you did, the, uh, <laughs> well, we spend a lot of money. <laughs> we spend a lot of money on bees, um, but. The demand keeps increasing, right? So uh, blueberries, with a good price. You know, you're going to continue with a good crop. Um, apples are growing, so the demand is out there, and uh, we really have to uh, take a hard look at it. Yeah. Well, Larry and Vernes. So when it comes to the climate adaptation, uh, I mean, you're starting to give me a little bit of a sense, but you know, I've talked about uh, wanting to increase our livestock numbers here too. What types of programs can the climate adaptation uh, do to increase the amount of livestock here? Because there's a bit of a oxymoron with that when it comes to climate adaptation and more livestock. Uh, what, what's your sense? Is, is this program able to uh, be used to increase livestock numbers? Uh, well, we are they the working against each other? Strategy plan that uh, in in the last section that we already went through, but uh, <clears throat> where it's focused on increasing the herd on Prince Edward Island. O'Leary and Burness? One of the issues that we have to deal with in that is also dealing with uh, the methane caused from manure and things of that nature, uh, storage and, and whatnot. So is there any creative uh, programs that you think could be done through climate adaptation and this money to uh, reduce that? but yet increase our numbers is what I'm trying to get at. Yeah, no, we've had uh, early conversations with um, Department of Environment on 
possible some methane captures, some digesters. I know the minister is yeah, very, uh, very excited about uh, getting some di methane digesters on the island, and uh, to have those, he, he needs manure. So uh, it's uh, the Department of Agriculture is very. Um, uh, sorry. And uh, it's something that uh, we're looking at. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Chair. Uh, do I back on the list? Yes. Leader of the third priority. So there were I think four or five separate parts uh, or, or, or funding streams coming out of this program. We, we talked a little bit about these, but there were other things here as well. The uh, the sustainability cap program. Um, the have we figured out yet? how we're going to pay producers for sequestering carbon. Is that, like, a, a no doubt there are conversations going on between you and the feds on this. But there's nowhere that's really, really done a, a, a job of figuring out what, what we're going to, you know, how much we pay per ton to, to capture. But where are we on that conversation? Uh, I haven't been updated on that, but this is where uh, Adam and his team will We'll come with, up with those formulas and um, to see where where we're going to go in the future. Leader of the third party. Right, because that's a, to me that's a really critical part of, of us being able to transition to net zero. Um, well, writ large, but specifically within the agricultural sector, is that we need to be able to pay farmers for doing the work that they do to offset the uh, carbon that we're putting into the atmosphere. And until we figure out what is a fair price for, um, what, for a ton of carbon being removed, um, farmers are not going to know whether the work that they're doing, whether it's to move to no-till agriculture or to plant willow trees around uh, riparian zones or whatever, whatever it is, what sort of return or what, what compensation they're going to receive for doing that work, which benefits all of us. So do you have a sense of when those conversations are going to happen on when we're going to actually be able to come to farmers and say, if you do this, you will, we'll give you $100,000. Uh, Chair, th those conversations are happening now. Those conversations are happening across the globe. Um, I think we'll, um, there will be a point where uh, we'll be farming carbon, and uh, I think it'll be in the near future. It's exactly when, I can't tell you that, but uh, the way things are moving, it's uh, quite possibly pretty soon. Mm. Leader of the third party? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you, Minister. Um, and of course, we took a f few steps backwards, uh, to use your phrase, when Fiona hit, hit us last year. You know, our forests are perhaps the biggest carbon sink that we have here, soil also properly managed. And clearly, the, the damage to our forests and the estimates that I've read are that 50% of the softwoods that we're standing are, are flattened. And that carbon, of course, is going to be released into the atmosphere as those trees decay or, or whether we choose to chip them and put them in uh, burners or what, whatever happens to them, that carbon is going to go back into the atmosphere. So there's, there were some substantial losses when it came to that. Reforesting is going to be a big part of um, our carbon capture process. I know there's, and I know this is not in this department, uh, or this section rather, uh, but funding for new forestry, and I, I remember from the budget yesterday that there were funds for that. But um, I guess going back one, one bit to the bees, do we know what impact Fiona had on bees? I'm going to come back to the forest in a second, but that's a question I was going to ask in the previous section. Was Fiona devastating for bees, or like did it have any impact on, on them at all? Uh, Chair, I, I don't know. I'll have to bring that back. Leave the third party? Right. And then, okay, so back to the forest then. So in terms of reforestation, um, what incentives are we offering? And would that be seen in this section here or not? Reforestation? Yes. I mean, is, is that a different department altogether? That's an that's, uh, environment. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move on to the controlled, controlled environment farming, which is, I stand to be corrected, that is part of this section of the funding for this. And one of the big values of tunnels or greenhouses is it can expand our season and the more 
we can grow here and become self-sufficient in food, that there's all kinds of benefits from that, socially, environmentally, economically, huge potential benefits to that. Um, are you working with local producers to, I presume this controlled environment farming, part of that will be capital funds to increase the acreage that we have under glass or tunnels, is that fair to say? Yes, and it's a uh, new initiative as well, and uh, hydroponics uh, and uh, ultraviolet, and uh, you know, all options that this this department's going to explore. Lead of the third party. Yeah, and I've been approached by a couple of folks who have um, new businesses here on Prince Edward Island um, to expand the number and the uh, and the size of greenhouses that we have here. And I'm wondering whether we're doing any partnership with local businesses to make sure that if we are going to expand the, the um, inventory of greenhouses and tunnels here, that we're sourcing that, if at all possible, from local suppliers. Yeah, it, this, this is a new department, like I say. And they're working with everyone to get it, to make sure they get it right. So, yes. Leave it to the third party? Right. So, uh, the salaries in this section, um, and I know that those figures from last year are just comparators. I, I, I understand that because it didn't exist, but how many positions does that represent? Can you give us a sense of the structure of this new department? Yep. So we're looking at uh, eight full-time equivalents in here, of which two um, have salaries offset because they work in regenerative agriculture. Um, and we have three new positions associated with the creation of, of this section, so they have yet to be filled. Leave the third party. Okay. Um, so <coughs> we heard this morning that the Atlantic premiers have all sort of come out in favor of delaying the implementation of the clean fuel standards. Uh, and that, as I understand it, is in part because of their impact on producers like, like folks in the agricultural sectors. And I'm wondering if you can explain how, we, how this government is helping farmers adapt to climate change and to reduce their individual carbon footprint. Okay. Big question, I understand that, but if we're, if we're going to ask for a delay in the clean fuel standards, we need to make sure that... The, the Who sent that one down? Anyway. Um, what are we doing? Uh, everything from uh, low fuel emission tractors to you know uh, new technologies to uh, innovations in low till, no till, uh, precision agriculture. I, uh, the most effective way to uh, save on our fuel in the agriculture industry is per, per, uh, precision agriculture, and if we uh, I think in our sustainable cap, you can help uh, with buy that technology with, with uh, that funding, and uh, uh, you know that's what sustainable cap is all written about: is uh, how to save fuel and how to to make it uh, more economical and lower the inputs. Leave you a third party. Yeah, sure. I appreciate that, and it's a that's a big topic, and there's a million parts to it. I I understand that. So if, if this clean fuel. Um, standards regulations if if they are brought into place what are what is your department going to do to offset offset the costs that will be borne by farmers um, if that goes ahead uh, this is all very new uh, we're still being updated the premiers uh, just brought this to our attention in, a, in probably in the last uh, week so uh, those I can't really answer that question today, but uh, over the next time, if if this is the case, we have to find out some more details. We'll definitely uh, have to uh, work with our industry to make some changes to help uh, mitigate some of the uh, economic uh, effects that it might have. Are you a third party? Uh, I agree, and I realize this is all new, but it the, you know one of the ironies of this is that our primary sectors farming and fishing and, uh, and tourism are very dependent on a stable climate and as climate change continues and, and deepens and worsens, the costs to our 
to those sectors or the threats to those sectors in, increase as well. And um, I think the mistake we make sometimes is that we figure, oh, well, we can't, we can't do these things because it's going to cost us too much money. But doing nothing is costing us increasingly year to year, is costing us all, all kinds of money. So I think we, if we are going to move in the direction of getting off fossil fuels as quickly as we possibly can for the benefit of us all, including and perhaps particularly farmers because they are impacted so directly by this, we have to be there to support them if there are going to be increased costs to them. So um, I, I, uh, I really hope that um, although this is new and I understand that, that we don't go into this with the mentality and I hope uh, around the cabinet table minister as, as, the, as the minister who is there representing and advocating on behalf of farmers that we understand that climate change is a huge threat to their livelihood going into the future and that, and that we will be, that even if you don't have a program in place now, I really want to know from you that you're going to be advocating for programs to offset the costs to farmers. 100%. Thank you, I'm good, Chair. Uh, shall the section carry? Carry, uh, shall total agricultural resources 13,720,300 carry? Carry. We'll move on to strategic policy and evaluation. Policy planning and evaluation. Appropriations provided for planning, development, and implementation of departmental and federal provincial territorial policies and initiatives. Administration 20,800, equipment 5,000, material supplies and services 11,800, professional services 2,500, salaries 816,400, travel and training 30,100, grants 574,000, total policy planning and evaluation 1,460,600. Are there any questions? Chair. Leader of the third party? <clears throat> so, can you tell us what the policy development priorities are for this particular department? Uh, this, this section is responsible for planning development um, of federal, provincial, territorial pro pro processes, um, and uh, they're also involved with performance evaluation, too. In terms of programming and okay, leader of the third party is this the the department that would be negotiating cap? Uh, all sections would be involved, um, but yes, they would be the the leader in terms of negotiating the contract. Okay, and leader, I, leader of the third party. Thank you, Chairman. I know that's a critical critical part of the uh, of the future of agriculture here on PEI, and I'm wondering how the how work is going between the province and the provinces rather than the federal government on those negotiations for CAP? It's, it's going uh, going well. Um, it seems since, from what I understand, I haven't been involved in an FBT in over a year with this department, but uh, from my briefings, uh, things are going good and uh, people, uh, real excitement. And Leader of the third party. Thank you, Chair. So, can you give, give us some ideas? I mean, maybe you haven't had a briefing at this to this level on this, but what, what new programs or policies we might expect to see coming through the, the new agreement? I haven't had a detailed briefing on this yet. So. Mm -hmm. Leader of the third party. Move on. So, a, a broad question. Um, we rearranged the departments. And uh, what used to be agriculture and land, the land was sectioned off and, and it's now under a, a housing, land and communities. And I'm wondering if that separation of the department, I mean, obviously some staff would have had to have moved. I'm assuming some staff would have been involved in both aspects of the previous department, agriculture and land. So I'm wondering how, if at all, that affected your capacity for <coughs> policy and, and, and providing programs. Uh, I, I don't think it'll change too uh, that much. Um, it's it was two separate buildings anyway. The land or, or we're in a separate office from uh, 
Department of Agriculture. So um, uh, I think the better question would be for Minister of Housing and Land, who has taken it over, than uh, our department. So. Leader of the Third Party? Sure, I, I understand that the new department would obviously have uh, different challenges, but I, I think it's important to know that because some substantial, presumably, number of staff that would have been in the Agriculture and Lands Department previously have now been seconded to another place, or maybe part of their job is gone. So any time you reorganize departments like that, it's, there's a sort of short-term um, hit that you take because... I, I, I don't think we're going to, we're, we're not seeing this. It was, um, we kind of in, inherited land. <laughs> they were almost operated in two separate uh, department, or departments uh, anyway. Uh, maybe Andrea's department uh, might have a little less work with the, uh, or with policy because it's just agriculture now. I don't think we're going to one staff would move. That was devoted okay. to land. Okay. Sorry. One staff moved. Um, Leader of the third party? I presume now that the Lands Protection Act, which of course you were intimately involved with previously, that has all been moved over to the other department? That's not your sort of purview at all, eh? Sorry, excuse me. No. Leader of the third party? Um, I'm good for now, Chair. Thanks. Shall the uh, section carry? Carry. Total strategic policy and evaluation, 1,460,600. Shall carry? Carry. Uh, we'll move on to animal health regulatory and analytical labs, division management, appropriations provided for management and support of the animal health regulatory and analytical labs division, administration, 1,300, materials, supplies, and services, 800, salaries, 163,100, Travel and training, 3,400. Total division management, 168,600. Leader of the third party? Well, usually there's actually a drop in salaries here. Can you explain what's is a is position moved? Or? Just with the, sorry, just with the new sections, there's some cost sharing among administration. Okay, I understand. Yeah. Well, good, thanks, Chair. Shall the section carry? Carry. Animal Health and Research, appropriations provided to assist the agriculture and aquaculture industries in animal health protection, promotion, and disease prevention. Administration, 8,000. Equipment, 6,500. Material supplies and services, 54,800. Professional services, 200,600. Salaries, 381,800. Travel and training, 11,100. Grants, 275,000. Total animal health and research, 937,800. Are there any questions? Uh, Charlottetown West Royalty? Um, in the grants, um, it seemed to go up uh, in the 2022-23 budget forecast, and then it dropped to 275,000. That obviously, did that go somewhere else? Or is... That's Fiona-related programming. Okay. So, Charlottetown West Royalty? What was that for? Um, that was for um, on-farm electrical interruption, so generator programming to assist with resiliency. Okay. Um, Charlottetown West Royalty? Was that, was that provincial money in the end, or was that federal? Yeah, primarily provincial, and we could have some offset. And Jay, Jay, West Road, do you have another question? Thank you. Yeah. And uh, did we did we spend it all? We're in the process of spending. It. There's a this was to help uh, firms either upgrade their generators or get uh, get generators if they didn't have any. So it's uh, there's a supply chain issue right now, and so some of the money is. Yeah, they're waiting for the new generators to come. So, so Charlton West Road, do you have another question? How many farms? Charlton West Road. Thank you. Yes, I do. Yes. Okay. The new style of chairing. I, I'm just getting. It's comfortable. easy when you come through the chair, for sure. Yes, it definitely <laughs> is. Yes. You need a beard. Um, I'm trying to go slow. So, how many farms are without generators now, awaiting um, generators to come in because of, of a backlog? 
sure if you have that. I believe, sorry, Chair. I believe we have 134 that we expect to be paid out in 2023 24. So those would be ones that were approved under this program, but because of supply chain shortages, they, they'll be paid out in the next fiscal. Chair? Shall I wish Um So can we, can we ensure that they will get them if, if we experience another hurricane season uh, this year? From my understanding, a lot of them will be here before September. Cheryl Dan West Royalty? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, can, can, we, can you table any data there that, from this program so we can have it? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Great. I'm good right now, Chair. Uh, Cheryl Tan Victoria Park. Chair. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the research priorities for animal health in the department. Sorry, I just the, couldn't hear you. The research priorities for animal health. Okay. Um, uh, it, for animal health, I'm not sure we have any research funding for that. But, uh. yeah. So if you look at your professional services handout, there is some research in there um, that's listed. So crop adaptability to climate change, um, climate prediction model for Prince Edward Island, uh, web-based integrated pest management system and testing potato varieties under predicted climate change. Charlton Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, in other provinces like BC, we've seen um, them take a public health approach to animal health. Mm -hmm. And so looking at um, recognizing that animal health can have implications on the health of, of people. And so how is government making the connection here between those two things? What Are there any things that we're working on right now in that regard? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure exactly on that example, but uh, the one thing they are working on right now is uh, uh, helping to, or in conversation with the Atlantic Vet College on uh, as you're probably aware, vet shortages as well, um, particularly in the large animal sector. And uh, uh, I know as Atlantic provinces, uh, we're having conversation with the Atlantic Vet College, how we can we um, get more large animal vets through, and uh, we're, hopefully they'll have an, an announcement to come in the coming months and how a, a, a solution, a long-term solution for that is. So that's what we're working on now. So. Cheryl Town, Victoria Park. Thank you, Chair. And so we've been hearing a lot internationally about the avian flu outbreak. And I'm wondering um, if we know that that affects animals beyond birds. And, and so I'm wondering if, if you can explain how we're monitoring avian flu and PEI. So our provincial vet, uh, Dr. Jill Wood, is... Uh, she would be she she would be in charge of that, and uh, she has uh, uh, her staff uh, monitoring monitoring uh, things um, all the time. But uh, when it comes to wildlife, that's environment. They they do that monitoring. But there's a connection between our two departments. There, so. Cheryl Town Victoria Park. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. And so this might not. What, may, if you work together with them, I'm wondering, does your department communicate with, like, the chief public health office on on things like this? Oh, for sure, yeah. Cheryl and Victoria Park. One last question on that: Is there has there been any, is there any, um, like, in your most recent uh, communications <coughs> with that? What I'm curious, what kind of what the most recent communications around that have been? If you would have an that. avian flu. Yeah. Um, I haven't um, been briefed on, uh, other than the Minister of Environment gave me a quick briefing uh, yesterday on a, on a case, but uh, I'm not 100% sure I want to speak on it because it's <laughs> more in his department. But anything with biosecurity uh, that would affect our, our uh, livestock industry, our, our provincial vet is any biosecurity, she, she, they are on top of that. So. I'm good, Chair. Thank Shall you. Oh, uh, leave that position. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Minister, you mentioned uh, Dr. Wood, and 
there was questions of following up on the avian uh, the flu. So I know she'd be a great person to set up because she has a personal interest in poultry um, with that. And uh, I think she's actually a leader in the 4-H program uh, of poultry. So she would have that interest in it. But are you hearing anything from poultry producers about meat and, uh, and, and egg production on the concerns that they may have? Uh, it continues to be a grave concern uh, for that industry. Um, fortunately, it's, it hasn't gone away, um, but fortunately we've been able to keep it out of our, our, uh, commercial, um, our commercial flocks uh, to date, and uh, that's a lot of uh, good work from the, the industry itself and uh, Dr. Jill Wood and her staff on uh, just educating everyone and uh, keeping uh, close monitoring on uh, the situation. And uh, it's definitely a huge concern for the industry and uh, knock on wood that we, uh, we don't uh, have a ca case in our commercial flocks. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so is there any indication that we might be at the peak of this or is there any... Um, Indication that this might be something that will pass hopefully soon. Um, I, I probably shouldn't uh, speak on that, but it's something I'll definitely bring back. And, okay. uh, get the Shall the section carry? Uh, regulatory services appropriations provided for the enforcement of legislation and the operation of services and programs associated with animal health and welfare and plant health. Administration 11,900. Equipment, 3,800. Material supplies and services, 280,100. Professional services, 8,800. Salary, 786,500. Travel and training, 95,700. Grants, 1,179,500. Total regulatory services, 2,366,300. Any questions? Board and Kinkora. Thanks, Chair. Would this here minister be the section? This is the section. So can you give us an update of where we are on the movement of seed potatoes um, from the province, uh, giving the CFIA? Uh, I can... I, I can't give a, a real detailed uh, update. Uh, it's obviously uh, with CFIA right now and the testing. Um, but I, th I believe the testing is uh, finishing up and they're starting to uh, explore the, the data. I do know our department is working closely with the, uh, the panel and CFIA on uh, information, and, uh, but we pa patiently uh, wait until uh, we, we have some more information but it's moving uh, probably not as quickly as we want it to but it is moving and uh, hopefully it's so, uh, comes out positive in the next uh, time the next over the next few months we hope for Kinkora thanks chair so are the I guess the guidelines or are in place now are they are they at a, at a level that that uh, helps protect the movement of seed or any concerns around that or if you well uh, we're working with a long-term management plan of course and uh, CFIA plays uh, a very important uh, role in that and uh, we, we are working with them and uh, and we're following all the expert uh, panel recommendations the experts were here last fall uh, from around the globe to uh, and uh, we're doing everything we can. We're working with the industry, uh, but it's right, right now it's a it's a it's a sensitive topic. Uh, there's I'm limited what I can report to the house here today, mm -hmm. just because uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of work yet to be done, and a lot of uh, it's more CFIA CFIA have to uh, finish their work first. Board Kinkora, the final question. Um, so that's, that's good to know that you're working on it and stuff like that, and then there's them conversations going on, on. I can understand what you're saying about the sensitivity around it. I have no problem with that whatsoever. Um, the final question, I guess, would be is, is are we also working with our uh, American allies and our, our contacts in the United States to uh, 
on this as we go forward? Yeah, we uh, continue to uh, to build that relationship and to <laughs> to uh, to go forward. And uh, right now, uh, it's a it's a good working relationship. And uh, but it's it's a waiting game right now. And uh, we wait for those final decisions and uh, all the pieces to come into place here. So, Thank you very much, Minister. Uh, the member from Charlottetown, Victoria Perk. Thank you, Chair. Um, in some other provinces, they've been moving the regula regulatory and uh, um, enforcement functions for uh, animal health and welfare outside the realm of agriculture and putting it into um, like social ju or to uh, justice, for example. And I'm wondering if this is something that you've considered and if you've kind of weighed kind of those pro pros and cons um, of what that might look like. Uh, that's a good question and it, we have had that discussion. Uh, right now it's, it's working well for us in agriculture and uh, as long as it continues to do that, uh, I think it's. I think it's that's the place for it. And um, yeah. Cheryl Victoria Perk. Thank you, Chair. I, I guess, given um, some animal advocates that I've spoken to about this, and one of the challenges is is that we have animal welfare under the same department as. Um, uh, what was the word there, but where you promote agriculture and that side of things, so like as for food production. Um, and so do you see, are, like are you satisfied that the department is able to keep those two things separately? Because it's kind of two completely different functions, if you know what I mean. Right. Um I understand where you're, you're coming from, and uh, that is a good question. And uh, as of right now, I, I do feel it is okay, and uh, I wear both hats. So um, right now, the Department of Agriculture, they sure they you look at it that way, but they do know animals, and they do know um, uh, the health of animals, and they're experts in that. So I trust that uh, it's it's a good fit right now for, for where it's at. Sheldon Victoria Park. And something that you're willing to kind of remain open to? Oh, absolutely. And we always, uh, of course, you, you have oversights in this because it's, uh, you, you always go with outside veterinarians. Uh, they, they're the, the ones that, uh, there's always a third party that uh, does a checkup on this before any animal is seized, before animals are seized or anything like that. Cheryl Dan Victoria Perk. Thank you, Chair. And how do you um, determine the health and, and welfare of animals? Is it, is, are there like surprise inspections or is it kind of more reactionary if you, if you get a complaint then you would go investigate or is it something that's ongoing? Uh, it's, it's complaint based. So once you get a complaint, uh, our inspectors do the follow up and uh, and if there can be many follow-ups, uh, there's guidelines that they follow, and, uh, yeah. and we work with the vets on every everything when it's, it revolves around animal health and animal welfare. Sheldon Victoria Perk. Thank you, Chair. Um, what outcomes is the department trying to achieve in relation to animal welfare? Um, is it kind of I have a couple of examples if that'd be helpful, so that the welfare of every every animal is protected that livestock are kept healthy, um, to maximize commercial returns? Like what are, what are kind of some of the goals that you would say you have for animal welfare within the department? Uh, their goal is <laughs> to protect animals and to uh, the, the well-being of all animals and the welfare, make sure they're treated right and fed right and uh, uh, looked after right. And uh, that's... Uh, big part of their job and uh, and it's it's not an easy job it's uh, something that uh, uh, they take quite seriously Sheldon Victoria Park. thank you chair one last question on this session section I'm wondering how you assess whether that goal has been reached and that you've achieved these outcomes after every uh, there's follow-up there's uh, procedure that they um, 
everything is overseen by uh, Dr. Uh, Sanford, and she's uh, the director of this, and uh, to make sure that all the uh, all the proper uh, techniques, proper uh, everything was followed by the letter of the law. I, that, just one more question, Chair. Shall I Victoria Park? Thank you, Chair. I'm wondering if is there what sort of or if, if the department offers any sort of education session on animal welfare, is there any sort of educational programs? I'm not sure, but they do follow the code of practice, and uh, um, I'm not I'm not sure on that. I'll have to bring that back. I'd be curious. I just out of curiosity, just curious to know that. But I'm good for now, Chair. Thank you. Shall the section? Oh, uh, leader of the opposition. Thank you, Mr. Just to follow on this, you talked about the code of practice, and, and um, so. What is the criteria or that has to be met for an animal to be uh, considered in a, a I don't know, a on humane uh, housing or distressed? Yeah. So, but I talked to some people and they say, well, as long as they called animal welfare because this horse was tied up outside and had no shelter, uh, it had no water. Does what are the necessities when they do the checkoff? Does it mean as long as they have a supply of water, shelter, and feed? Is that is that it? Or there's a code of practice which they follow, mm -hmm. and that you have to have certain standards. Um, our officers go in, in the initial, and uh, before anything else is done, a veterinarian has the final. Uh, so a veterinarian has the final sign off uh, if this animal is in distress, if this animal is undernourished. Leave the opposition. Chair, so but would shelter, like uh, from the elements, mm -hmm. sun, rain, snow, and all that, be one of the factors in yep. that? Mm -hmm. okay. Chair? Leave the opposition. Thank you. Um, the complaints, how are the complaints, what's the process to complain for an individual to make a complaint to uh, this uh, division? Uh, they call our department and uh, our officer. An officer will go out and inspect, do an inspection. The leader of the opposition. Thanks, Chair. Have you seen a, an increase in complaints over the past year, a couple of years, or a decrease, or is it status quo? Actually, that's something I haven't gotten mm -hmm. a briefing on yet. I'll have to bring that back. Um, leader of the opposition. Basically, I guess that's about it on that. I guess you answered my questions. Thank you. Shall the section carry? Yeah, carry. carry. Oh, sorry, leader of the third oh, party. Um. <coughs> I know that the in uh, I think it was in BC. There's, I mean, there's increasing concern in many places about diseases that spread from animals to humans. Um, and in BC, I think they shut down mink farms. I think it was because of the, the concern. And I'm wondering whether there you have what the situation is here on Prince Edward Island regarding that. Uh, I, I have to bring that back. I don't yeah. have any updates or anything to report on that. So, yeah. uh, uh, unrelated to that, and I heard the leader of the opposition uh, talk about avian flu. Um, you know, that's not gone by by any stretch, and, and I'm wondering whether you feel that precautions that we're taking now are sufficient, and what what conversations you're having with other jurisdictions about making sure that the Flocks here, uh, both commercial and, and and the wild flocks are are being protected. I, I think we're, well, we're doing an excellent job, and we do have the emergency response, poultry response in place, ready to go if we do have an outbreak here. And um, yeah, the, our provincial vet is always in contact with the other provinces, uh, getting an update on this all the time. Uh, I just don't have a, personally get that up. Didn't get that update yet, so but I can bring any information back that I okay. think she might have. So. Right, leave the third and, and on that note, uh, Minister, what what would an emergency response look like well, to an outbreak of avian flu? That's a euthanization of a, a flock, and uh, they have uh, the process in place and all the training done to do that. We hope we don't have to use it. Of course. Sure. Leader of the third party. Um, so clearly, prevention is the way we want to go here. We never ever want to end up in that situation, for sure. Uh, and I know that.
for the general public, you know, we're, we're encouraged during the winter time, particularly not to put our feeders out because it encourages congregations of birds in one place and, and enhances the spread of disease. And there are also some very strict protocols in terms of who can go into a barn, you know, with chickens in or whatever. Or whatever. Um, are, are, there, are there other measures that you feel we should be taking so we don't ever end up in that situation where we have to euthanize a, a large flock? Uh, I, I, I go by the experts' advice, and uh, they have it fully under control with a lot of... Uh, the industry is very, very, very on top of this, and uh, uh, it seems to be uh, being controlled. Uh, they're taking every precaution they can, so I trust the experts and uh, what their recommendations uh, will continue to follow. Okay. Good. I'm good. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Tyne Valley Sherbrooke. Question on that. Is there any inspections um, on, say, the little hobby farms, or are they just left up to complaints or the vets to, you know, upon a visit to put in a complaint or any complaint is followed up on. So yeah, no matter the size. Yeah. Oh yeah. But there's no. Um, Valley Sherbrooke. But um, there's no actual inspection, though. Is there for? Oh, uh, hobby farms. A routine inspection, no. Shall the section carry? Soil and Feed Lab. Appropriations provided for the operation of the Soil and Feed Laboratory. Administration 52,000. Equipment 11,100. Material supplies and services 160,600. 160, Professional services 28,400. Salaries 803,100. Travel and training 2,600. Total soil and feed lab, 1057800 Are there any questions on this section? Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Chair, I just have a question on the salary increase. Uh, can you just uh, elaborate on what that uh, is for, or the reason? Yeah. So we're hiring a new lab technologist in, in the soil lab. Uh, so this is, a, sorry, Chair. Leader of the Opposition. This is a new position that's being created? That's correct. If you look at the forecast, the and on the revenue side, the lab was extremely busy. Um, they have an extra hundred thousand in revenue, um, and there's a lot of demand for their services. So this technologist will help with that, along with the healthy soil initiatives. It all falls in line. Thank you. Pretty impressive lab. Leader of the opposition. No, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. Uh, leader of the third party. Thanks, Chair. Is this the department or the section under which SHIP is uh, run, Soil Health Improvement Program? We've passed that already. I think we passed that already. Okay. So can you tell me what the Soil and Feed Lab actually does? They do all the analysis on the soil lab, on so all the soil tests and dairy, uh, do the dairy tests and feed tests. Any. Any analysis that's done. So. Leader of the third party. Right. So I've, again, it's just some own benefit. I mean, they're looking for potential diseases or quality of you know, the amount of protein in feed, for example. Like, what, what are they be looking for? Uh, anything from. Uh, I don't have the exact details, but uh, yeah, no. Uh, anything from molds to micro. Uh, micro molds or anything uh, like that, right. any diseases, yeah. Okay. Leader of the third party. So I understand that the ship is not funded in this department, but is this where the testing would be done? Yes. To confirm or that, that uh, 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 yeah, okay. Good, I'm good, thank you, Chair. Shall this action carry? Sure. Dairy and Plant Diagnostics Laboratory, appropriations provided for the operation of the Dairy and Plant Diagnostics la Laboratory. Administration 75,400, equipment 2,900, material supplies and services 220,100, professional services 2,500, salaries 393,900, travel and training 8,200, total dairy and plant diagnostics laboratory. Questions? Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. Just an uh, obvious question under salaries. Again, this time there's a decrease in cal salaries. Can you explain that, please? 
appropriate time to get my chocolate milk out of here. <laughs> so it's, it's just sharing, sharing of services or sharing of staff between a couple of different divisions here. Neither that position. I'm not sure. Um, could you just explain a little bit more, uh, Sharon, with what division? Uh, there be some sharing with the other lab, and there's a reduction in some of the miscellaneous salary accounts. So callback, standback, or callback pay, and some other. Leader of the opposition. Okay, thanks, Sarah. It's not a, a huge difference. I was just yeah. asking what it, what it might be, but this uh, this basically. Uh, deals with uh, the lab primarily with, with in the dairy industry, obviously, um, but with milk, right? The quality testing milk and the quality of milk mm -hmm. and such. Um, can you just give us a little bit more of the plant diagnostics part of it? What they would, what they do. So this would be the diseases, uh, any and the analysis, chemical analysis of soils, and uh, um, <clears throat> yeah, this is where. All our soil gets tested for minerals and uh, everything else, and organic matter. Leader of the opposition. Thanks, Chair. So I'm getting a little confused between the soil and feed lab and the dairy and plant diagnostics. So laboratory. I was misspoken. It, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, that was my fault. Yeah. The protein, the soil and feed lab measures proteins and uh, the feeds, and uh, it's analysis of grains. Sorry. This is the disease <laughs> section. The, the, the plant soils. diagnostics is the disease. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. That was, that was my uh, that's, that's good, Chair. Show the section carry. Uh, total animal health regulatory and analytical labs, 5,233,500. Child carry. Mm -hmm. Total Department of Agriculture, 21,104,700. Child carry. Thank you, Minister. Members, we are on to page 30. Uh, PEI Agriculture Insurance Corporation. You didn't even hear yet. I know. Are you uh, good to continue on, Minister? Let's do it. PEI Agriculture Insurance Corporation General. We're now on page 31. Appropriations provided for the administration of farm business risk management programs. These programs include agri-insurance, agri-stability, and the agri-recovery framework. Administration. Three million eight hundred thirteen thousand five hundred. Debt, fifteen thousand. Equipment, thirty-nine thousand. Material supplies and services, forty-three thousand. Professional services, two hundred thousand four hundred. Salaries, two million six hundred twenty-seven thousand five hundred. Travel and training, two hundred thirty thousand nine hundred. Grants, the Agri Insurance Program, thirty-nine million nine hundred seventy-seven thousand. Agri Stability Program, six million five hundred seventy-three thousand. Total General, fifty-three million five hundred nineteen thousand three hundred. Any questions? Leave the opposition. Okay, the last question is uh, this, uh, administration. Uh, why is there a difference in uh, in that budget line from last year? So you're looking at the increase. From budget in, to budget? In administration. From budget to budget or budget yeah, from to budget forecast? to budget. Okay. Yeah. Um, so part of it is related to the coverage on potato unit price. We had an increase of two dollars and fifty cents per <coughs> hundred weight. Um, so this would increase the total value of our fund, which would mean that our reinsurance costs also go up because our total value of insured okay. goes up. Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. Professional services. Um, there was an increase, but uh, this year, over last year's um, budget estimate, but there was a, the forecast is much lower. Can you explain that? Yep. So we, um, in response to the AG's report, we have some modernization work going on to um, modernize the services at AIC. So last year in 22-23, the budget included the total amount for that, all in professional services. Um, but if, if you look across, we actually use some of the funds to purchase equipment. So printers that they can take um, on the road with them and those things. So it was just reallocated to other sections within AIC. And then there's a further increase in the budget for 23-24 that relates to additional work to be undertaken for modernization. 
Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, there's also an increase in salaries. Was there a new position created, or is that uh, money that was from, the, I guess, increase in wages? Yep. There, there's two items in there. So one is the collective bargaining agreement mm -hmm. that was negotiated. And then in addition, in addition to that, there's one new permanent position um, for a, a verifier. Okay. Leader of the Opposition. Can you just explain what a verifier is? <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are they verifying? I guess. Yeah. That's your job. <laughs> <laughs> Something like you. I can't. I can't answer that question. Yeah. But. They verify something. If you can verify that, bring it back. <laughs> the minister will verify the verifier for you. Yeah. Leader of the opposition. Um, is there any uh, demand or ask from the industry for more? Um, I guess um, I'm trying to think of like crop insurance, right? For uh, is there any demand there for more employees within that uh, division? I think they're fairly well staffed. Uh, the demand will always be uh, probably more from the industry with specialty crops or new crops that uh, uh, we have to. Uh, improve the uh, insurance programs for those, but uh, as staff wise, I think we're staffed okay. Um, the opposition? Just one question about this. So, Fiona happened last September. Did that have any impact on uh, this particular program or the programs that are within this division financially? I, I wasn't here in this portfolio then, but uh, there was extra claims through uh, some examples, soybean and corn mm -hmm. crops, for sure. Um, but uh, uh, I'm not sure the financials. Yeah. I'd, have, I'd have to look into further de detail on that, but with respect to ag insurance, it just covers yield, yield losses. Um, and in terms of actionability, I think we're, we're almost, a, we have to wait for the year to finish to determine what, um, what the impact is because it, it's based on their margins and happens after they file their tax return to determine what the change were. Okay, thank Le you, Chair. I got it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, leader of third party. Thanks, Chair. We all know that there's, there are always concerns expressed by farmers about the insurance programs that we have that uh, they're too expensive that in order to qualify you have to have such a devastating loss that you you know it, it just doesn't often make sense for them to to subscribe to these programs and I'm thinking you mentioned corn just a minute ago and I know a couple of farmers in my district just you know they had devastating losses as a re result of Fiona and their corn crops but they didn't buy insurance because it just wasn't you know it wasn't it didn't make any sense for them to do that and I know that in the budget you had some increases to the agri-insurance program, quite substantial increases. And is that going to make these programs, do you think, more attractive to farmers so that you get a better rate of subscription? The changes that we made are probably uh, considered across the country as we were leaders in making uh, the adjustments to uh, that we did make on uh, the trigger uh, percentage and the overall coverage. Um, so I think we're, I mean, nothing's ever going to be perfect, but uh, we're, we're really making great strides, and uh, I think it's a continues to be a, something that most farmers are considering. So, hmm. leader of the third party? Yeah, I mean, we all want to see these programs work well for farmers. That's, that's what this is all about. But I, I mean, the ones that I, many of the ones that I speak to, have expressed frustration with the again the the cost of them and also the qualifying criteria when you do have a loss and you can you can make a claim. Um, can you explain the increases that you actually made? Because I know it was a percentage of the premiums that were going to be covered by the province. I believe that's what the increased costs are here. Can you just explain that a little bit? So uh, I'll have to bring that exactly back. Uh, it's been a while since I talked about this, so um, 
we went from 75 to 80 percent as the coverage and the trigger we we moved the trigger and I I, don't, I just can't give that exact number right now and you're the opposition or sorry leader of the third party right um, or are you talking about potatoes or no just the agri insurance program generally I think yesterday in the budget address the Minister of Finance mentioned about changing the percentage premiums that the government is going to kick in, which is, I, I presume, is that where the increase in the agri-insurance? I, I think you're, I think it may be the increase to the ag stability program, where the cover, once a loss is triggered, the coverage used to be, um, set, set, so if, say, the loss that they were allowed was 10,000, um, the coverage used to be 70%, yep. and we've increased it to 80%. Okay. So, so that, that's if they have a change in their margin. Right. Okay, but we won't see that reflected until next year's uh, claims, presumably, if there are any. Is that right? No, that'll be this year's claims. We'll be we made this. that change a year ago, so that you'll see it this year. Okay. Can you explain then the five million dollar approximately increase in the agri insurance program that we see here? So, so are you talking budget to budget? Uh, yes. I mean, the forecast and estimate from last year were pretty close, but now we've gone, okay. we went from basically 35 up to 40 million. Yeah. So a big, the biggest piece of that would be the increase on the potato unit price coverage. So from, it went from 12.50 up to $15. Um, so we anticipate that the uptake will be higher, but also the premiums will be higher because of coverage higher. Right. Leader of the third period. Thanks. So I, I guess as with all insurance programs, this is your best estimate of what the costs are going to be for any particular year, and I understand that that's a, you know, it, it is to a certain extent a guessing game. Um, so can you tell me like how, how you come up with, you just explained why the, the extra $5 million in the agri-insurance program might, might come about because of the increases in, in the potato sector, but is that, are those increases also, are we going to see them in other sectors of the uh, agricultural in industry? Or is that just for potatoes, that increase from 1250 nope. to 15? I realize that's related to potatoes. Yeah. So I think it's potato and grain. And as you said, there's all, it's always an estimate of what what's going to be planted, the number of acres, um, and the price that's going to be covered. And then all the premiums, all the premiums are set. Um, based on a predetermined formula that's actual, actuarially sound. Um, and we actually have certification that happens every three years to make sure that we're, we're setting it in, based on sound methodology. Sure, sure. Leave the third period. Final question on this, Chair. Um, I know we've seen the acreage of potatoes decline over the last 10 years or so, and typically around 80, 85. Do you know, do you know what, and the planting season's not over yet, but do you have a sense of what the total acreage of potatoes is going to be on the island this year? Um, no, I don't. But um, <laughs> talking with the uh, potato president of the potato board and the chair, or the chair, sorry, and the CFO, CEO, uh, just a couple of nights ago, uh, all I can tell you is that uh, half of the potato crop is in the ground. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, what that numbers are, I don't know yet. So. Okay, that's fine. I'm, I'm good. Thanks, Chair. Shall the section carry? Sure. Total PEI Agriculture Insurance Corporation, 53519300 Shall it carry? Sure. Thank you, Minister. Shall the department carry? Sure. You're good now. Can I use the washroom? You may. Minister, you're welcome to take the table. Where's housing? Okay. Where's housing? Welcome, Minister. Would you like to bring anybody to the floor with you? Yes. 
Uh, is request to bring a stranger onto the floor shall carry or shall, shall it be granted? granted? We are on page 127, Cheryl Dan Winslow. <laughs> Could you introduce yourself for Hansard? Marguerite Middleton. Minister, do you have uh, any opening comments or handouts? Well, I think, uh, do we need to table our, uh, our handout here? If you would like to, Minister. All right, my only comments are, this is new to me, <laughs> new to the department. New to me? Maggie's new to the department as well, I think three weeks in, although with much experience in, in other departments. Um, I think we've got a pretty good handle on things, but uh, might, might need a little leeway. Let's we'll get right into it. We're on page 128, uh, Department of Housing, Land and Communities, Minister and Deputy Minister's Office, appropriations provided for operation of the office of the Minister and Deputy Minister, administration 24,900, e equipment 25,000, material supplies and services 7,500, salaries 396,700, travel and training 45,900, total Minister and Deputy Minister's Office $500,000. Any questions? Uh, Charlton West Royalty. Uh, thank you, thank you. Uh, welcome, uh, Minister and Deputy Minister. I'd like to you know, just uh, welcome me. I know it's uh, difficult, it's important, this is a new section, and uh, maybe just some questions, some general questions here. So you have budgeted uh, half a million dollars, um, $396,000 in salaries. Um, how, how is that broken down? How many staff do you have? And, and uh, let's start there. Mm -hmm. so th those salaries represent uh, four staff there. Um, yeah, Charlton West Royalty, thank you for waiting for me. So I guess it's it's new with with housing is is not with social development anymore. It's with land and communities. Are those four staff? Um, what's the priority coming out of the office? I guess at the moment. Out of the minister's office. Yeah. What's our priority? Well. Uh, that would include uh, Jamie. Well, those, those, um, that's our deputy minister's salary, at two admins and an EA. So, um, obviously, we're running the department out of this office. So all the priorities of our department are directed from this office, but those salaries represent really um, leadership costs, and mid costs. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, time West royalty. Um, so I don't. Uh, so the mandate. Uh, did you receive um, in the minister's office? Obviously, it's new. Um, it, it's important to get clarity and, and, and planning at that position. Did you um, receive any kind of a mandate letter from the premier? I haven't received our mandate letters yet. Charlton West Royalty? Has that been in discussion? In discussion? It's an inquiry I make from time to time. <laughs> I'm being patient. Charlton West Royalty? Yeah, um, well, um, yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a priority of mine as the, as the critic for, for this, and I, I'd like to see, see some guidance because it is new, and I want to see how this is. And I guess my questions in the ledges have been, uh, have been important. Do you think, so, just looking at these, because there's nothing to really base it off of. Um, I guess I'm all, all right for this section right now. Shall the section carry? Uh, Cheryl Town Victoria Park. I'm wondering, so this combina this uh, department is a combination sort of of kind of three past departments. I'm wondering um, what staff were brought over into the new department. There's none in that department. None in this section. Okay. Thank you. Well, there'd be uh, the deputies admin, I guess, yeah. Come from the old department. Yeah, that's true. 
shall carry. Carried. Carried. Corporate services, uh, appropriations provided to support functions and services related to policy, legislation, planning, program development, evaluation, quality improvements, performance, federal, provincial, territory relations, administration, 26,300, equipment, 30,000, material supplies and services, 4,000, salaries, 539,700, grants, 500,000, total corporate services, 1,100,000. Are there any questions on this section? No. Charles Ham West Royalty. Uh, thank you. Um, what's, the, what's the new section? What's the scope of your planning? Scope of our planning. Well, um, it is a much larger department now uh, with three divisions from three separate departments coming together. Uh, obviously, the scope of our housing division is, is quite broad mandate to increase affordable housing, not only market housing all across the province. I would say that um, we're doing quite a lot of planning to um, set about our provincial land use plan. That's a huge undertaking that will require a lot of resource planning, public engagement, legislation. That is underway. Um, there is a lot of work going on around improving processes within the land division as well. It's an important part of helping to um, um, increase our supply of, of housing, accelerate our construction industry here, accelerate permitting. So uh, there's a lot of work going on there. Charlton, what's your role Thank you, Chair. Um, so you'd said in the legislature that kind of, kind of our, our scope is to build, build, build. I need more clarity on, on what that, what, what exactly that means. I don't remember. Y yes. Um, so I'm all about build up questions, leading questions to get to, you know, how it uh, applies to the grant of supply. But just when we're asking questions, maybe if, uh, you could refer to how this is impacting. So if you're asking about scope, it's because you're wondering if the corporate services has enough to deal with the full scope. Just bring it back to the grant supply when you're asking questions. If it's if it's if it's simply on policy or if it's on budget budgetary reasons. You know what I mean, honorable member? Uh, no, well, it's it's under it's this is under planning. I guess I'm just looking at the oh, word planning and, and trying to figure out the plans because it's a new section. We're actually debating the grant of supply. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so, so if you could just bring it back to somehow how your, your questions are relating to the amount that is uh, uh, being put forward for this division. Yeah. I guess I would just ask for a little bit of leeway on that, considering we, we didn't receive the, the information. I'm just getting it right right now. And I don't. So um, who, who is working on, sir? Uh, Charlton West Charlton. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, so, so you're planning. Who, who, who in the corporate services works on the planning of ha the housing plan? Collier. Save for the bell. You got, you got the weekend to study now. <laughs> it's like flying out. It's like whoa. Mr. Chair, I move that the speaker take the chair and that the chair report progress and beg leave to sit again. Shall I carry? He said something. I wonder how you're going to get it through that. Speaker, as Chair of Committee of the Whole House, having under consideration the grant of supply to His Majesty, I beg leave to report that the Committee has made some progress 
and begs leave to sit again. I move the report of the committee be adopted. Shall it carry? Very Honourable member from Kensington Malpeck. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move secondly by Suri Elmira that this House adjourn until Tuesday, May 30th at 1 p.m. Shall it carry? Very Have a good weekend, everyone.